I think we're here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cindy Beasley. I will be your moderator this evening for the Stone Soup community discussion um, to talk about an array of things to get us as a community continuing to push forward through the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to start by bringing in the boss man of what's the word TV himself. Uh, consider him co or main head, whatever you want to call him, event organizer for to even for this evening. Excuse me, I was gonna say for tonight. Cody Mack, how you feeling? I am feeling amazing. Can y'all hear me? We can. We can. Yeah, I'm feeling amazing. I'm feeling amazing. Thanks for the introduction, Cindy. No problem. Anything else you'd like to add, talk about um, before I get into a little bit more about why we're here and tell everybody exactly what Stone Soup is? Uh, No, I think yeah, I'm going to just go ahead and let you do it. All right, bet. Well, if you've been following us on social media, you've seen the promo that we're dropping. Uh, but Stone Soup is a European folk story in which hungry strangers convince the people of a town to each share a small amount of their food to make a meal that everyone enjoys. And it exists as a moral regarding the value of sharing. So it was only fitting that that was tonight's theme of the discussion um, because everyone that's here is, is here to share, to share their experience, to share their insight, to share their influence. Um, I, I think it goes without saying that this pandemic has not been the easiest thing to navigate, especially for the, the members of the black community. Um, so with that, I wanna jump right in and bring on our first group of panelists. We'll start with some great community leaders. We have Mr. Tim Flowers and Ms. Kena Collins with us this evening. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you all for joining. How's everyone feeling tonight? I'm feeling fine. Thank you for having Thumbs us. Up. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Okay, good. Um, so let's hop right into it. But I, I, I know what we're here to talk about, you know, just again, to remind everyone, we're talking about navigating through the pandemic. However, I think it would be grossly irresponsible um, of myself as a black woman of the platform that's black owned and black ran to not discuss George Floyd. Um, and not even only him, but you know, I, I, it seems to be, at least that we know of the most recent tragedy in the black community and in, in the country. Um, but we have others like Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, like, can you all, um, and we can, we can start with you, Kina, just kind of share your mindset um, and and where you are as far as just how we move on with this because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Again, no secret, but that doesn't stop racism. That doesn't stop cops from killing innocent black people. So can you talk to us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so I just want to thank you guys so much for inviting me onto the platform. I've watched What's the Word grow from this little infancy to what y'all are doing for the culture, and it's important. Um, you know, obviously I'm hurt I, uh, by what's happening around the country because this is not something that's new. It, it has always been the norm in the American empire um, that Black folks are dealing with police face sanctioned violence, even in a global health pandemic. Um, I think what's even more frustrating for me is that the only way that we oftentimes see action take place around these issues is when there's a viral consumption of black suffering that happens on the internet. And the only way that these American systems actually work is when black America has shamed them into actually doing something. So we have to move past that point of basically seeing these, these killings happen um, and perpetuate all over the media and then and then something happens. It has to be an automatic response. And so um, I've sat on police tasking force before. I don't trust a lot of these states. I'm not happy um, or satisfied that any of these people, these officers or those men are arrested because uh, them getting arrested is not accountability and it's not justice. The only justice that we can have at this point is if Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd were alive and that can't happen. 
So um, I don't see any of these as victories and I, and I weep for the families that have to go through this. Um, but we have to break this paradigm where this is the norm and us literally shaming the system is the only way that we get justice. And I, um, you mentioned you weep for the families. I weep, I, I, I definitely support that, uh, let's be clear. And I, I weep for us as a community too. How, how many times do I have to log on Twitter to get a giggle for the day, but instead I'm feeling like lost and confused because I'm seeing a video of a murder of someone who looks like me, of someone who is clearly saying, I can't breathe. And someone else is just ignoring that. You know, um, so Tim, if you could could talk to us, I know that you're very well versed in mentorship, especially with young black men. Um, and I, I know you you actively speak about these things on your own platform. Just share some of where you are and and how you would suggest for young black men to move, whether it be continue moving a certain way that you've already told them or pivot they need to take um, in a world where you know, people don't care about them, honestly. Um, I'll say like to, to, to answer the second part of your question first, as far as how I communicate and talk to my guys about being able to move throughout the city, I unfortunately have to have a conversation with them about not necessarily moving the right way when it comes to dealing with police officers, but I also have to tell them about the right ways, how to deal and how to move within our own communities. Um, I'm somebody, I'm from Inglewood, 72nd and Marshfield, so I grew up in that type of environment. And um, by God's grace, I was able to make it out of it. So I try to use things that I've done, tactics I've used to make it out, and other and, and friends of mine, and what they were able to do and able to make it out and how they was able to make it out. So my conversation with them is always making sure that you're at least trying to do the right things. You're not giving anyone in any situation a reason to want to target you, whether that's a person in the community or whether that's a police officer. So try not to give people reason to target you. Try to stay on the straight path as much as you possibly can. Um, it, it, to go into the first part, and I, I hope I can speak on like how I feel about things. Please. I am, uh, I am uh, honestly, wholeheartedly, and I was waiting to get to this point to speak today um, because me and Cody, we've had plenty of conversations. And he knows, like, just how my heart is, just what my heart is, if anything. And when it comes to that, I really love where I come from. I really love working with young people. I really love giving back to them. So it's frustrating to me because it just seems like no matter what we're doing in this country, whether it's good, bad, or different, we can all be treated the same way in any situation. Um, I don't know the full extent of what happened with George Floyd. Uh, Fulton, I'm sorry. But I I know that he was treated inhumanely. He was treated as if he his life had no value. And I see that in the day to day in our communities. Our young people killing each other and doing what they're doing. So I'm just frustrated. I would say my feelings on how where I am right now, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, I'm just frustrated because I want to see, you know, I, I, I'm really truly um, trying to figure out what the future is going to look like for my son. I, I, I think that'll kind of sum up where I am. If I can ask, how old is your son? My son is six. Okay. Baby if boy. I could, if I could interject a bit um, in there, because oftentimes when we have this conversation, we revert it back to, and I think that what Tim is saying is absolutely important um, mm -hmm. around just like being conscious of your surroundings, et cetera. And there's a lot of layers that we have to peel back when we talk about intracommunal violence of within our own community, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about police state sanctioned violence, we have to we have to remove this conversation of respectability politics and understand that we know black men across this country who have been gunned down in their graduation cap and gowns. They yeah. have completely complied. They have done everything that they're supposed to do and they still get gunned down. What we need to flip the conversation on is the accountability that needs to be held on the police department, on the DA's office, on the state's attorney's office, and in the mayor's office. And in our case, our aldermen. Uh, a story just broke in Block Club Chicago where they're, they're basically saying that the only arrests that have happened in this uh, pandemic have happened on the west sides and south sides of the city of Chicago. That is absolutely 100% unacceptable. When yeah. we have people who are losing their jobs, they are losing their basically their livelihoods and stepped outside of the house to get fresh air and we see Grand Park and it's cracking and nobody is getting arrested. 
So uh, for me, I'm I'm enraged, and I understand what Tim is saying, and I think it's is when black men speak on these issues, we do need to listen to them because they are a primary target around a lot of these issues. But I, I think that in order for us to shift the paradigm, we have to start holding accountability for these police officers, and specifically in the city of Chicago and across the country, the FOP, which is the Fraternal Order of Police, yeah. and the union contracts that they put out, not protecting the lives of civilians. For real quick, just let me finish. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Cindy. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, Kenna, what I, I would say is, is, is while in agreement with everything that you said, um, I'm going to always look at it the way that I look at it because I understand that that is a major problem that I fight against police brutality and the white supremacy aspect of it with Dylan Roof being able to go into a church and kill people in South Carolina and being kept down there from what we heard was fed Burger King on his way to prison. I mean, we know that those things are there, but my argument with people is always on, I'm huge on the aspect of men empowerment. And when I say that, meaning that we are the vanguards, we are the person that support us, supposed to support you. I understand you as a woman, intellectually, there are a lot of things that you understand that I never understand, mm -hmm. right? But you know what I do understand though? I do understand how to provide and how to protect. If I can't protect you in my community, if I can't protect our kids in our community on the day to day, how can I fight against the police to protect or to, to and fighting for protection from me from the police? I feel like, it. in my opinion, it starts at home. I always talk about guys, the need for more men needing to come together. Because when we stand tall and we together, then we can take on any and everybody. But how can we keep fighting fights when we're so divided? So that's the reason why I went into that. That's the reason why I feel that way. Cody, I'm going to let you go ahead. And then I have a question for Kina um, on her comments. Um. So uh, don't, uh, please don't take my smile. For, uh, it's like I'm not serious at the moment, but I just like to smile when I see like a lot of black estimates and information going on. I'm really happy right now. Um, but I think two things with me, well, w w first of all, with me, um, putting this thing together, it was like, yo, we got the, we know the issue. So I want to figure out like people watching so how we can get solutions. Um, and it's two things that stuck out to me and I kind of wanted to, uh, see if you guys can go deeper and give people more insight on. So Kenny, you said holding our aldermans accountable. Like, how do we go about doing that? And if I can add on to that, because I know you also mentioned the DA and the Fraternal Order of Police, are there any specific action items you can give the community? Yeah, absolutely. So number one, um, when we first off, I think that when you look at the moral compass of any city, state, country, it's in the city budget. What we have seen continuously in the Chicago city budget is an increase in the militarization of black communities and brown communities. And we've seen a divestment from the things that will stunt intracommunal violence and police brutality, things like investing in schools, investing in mental health facilities, investing in um, after school programming. Those are all things that curb and have statistically shown to help grow pro-social behaviors and you know, resolve conflict resolution. Um, so the one way that you can uh, pressure your aldermen is to make sure that they're putting forth an equitable city budget. Um, this is going to be extremely important as we move forward in COVID because we don't know the, what we have seen is that America is not as strong as we think economically. We, we have completely crumbled um, under this pandemic and it was literally a pandemic uh, that, that caused the crumbling of the economy. So basically talking to your aldermen about the city budget and how we plan to invest in communities that need those resources. Secondly, look at the activists and the people who are on the ground in your community and get them to run for office. When we are putting people forth who have our interests and have our best interests at heart, um, that's a vote for one of us, right? So we know that they're going to fulfill our agenda. And then just really quickly, um, you were saying, are there any actions on the ground around the FOP, the DA? Um, there have been a series of conversations that have come up now. William Calloway, who's the activist that filed the Freedom of Information Act um, for the Laquan McDonald tape to be released, is trying to galvanize people around making sure that we, uh, as a people, have a say in the union collective bargaining contracts that happens between the city and police officers. And that's something that we need to start paying attention to. Um, when we see police officers breaking the law, not following the consent decree, it's all because they're being protected by their union. And while they may have political power within themselves, there's 14,000 police officers. There's about a million, 1.2 million black folks in Chicago. So you guys do the math on who really has the power. Mm -hmm. um, so those are a few quick ways that I can think of. Check the city budget, 
build a relationship with your alderman. And if your alderman isn't doing what you're saying, get somebody in your community to run for that seat or you run for that seat. And then secondly, um, we are galvanizing and, and talking about moving on, um, being a part of the conversations of collective bargaining with police. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, and my next part is for Tim, sorry, Cindy. Um, so, so by you being the leader of men and by, you know, this is when we come from, like how you say we come from Inglewood, we come from these urban areas. Um, it's these, we got like these myths and we got these urban, these quote unquote urban myth, myths and legends like, yo, we don't rock with police. Like, like we strictly, we defend, like how you saying, defending yourselves. I think personally, I always thought like, yo, if we had more of our people to understand like, yo, if we became police, you know, yeah. like when we, like Kenny just said, when we became autonomous, like we can police and we can control our own neighborhood. Like what, what do you, what do you think can be done to shift the the mindset of the of the youth that it's okay to be a uh, be a law be a part of the law enforcement? It's okay to be uh be run for office. Man, I think one of the worst thing that has happened in our community, as far as actual community stuff, is the no snitching, no talking policy of it. And the reason why I say that is because that also goes into becoming a police officer. Most guys that I grew up don't want to be a police officer because they always look at police officers in the same respect as they look at somebody that goes to jail and snitch or do whatever. But to your point, one of the things that I talk about, I went to a meeting with Time 2136 in Inglewood. This is my Inglewood 2136. And one of the solutions that I gave, just from somebody that's working with young people, our young kids are so misinformed on what their relationship should look like with the police department. And then most of the times, by, while being misinformed, they're also being policed by people that see them as dangerous criminals and all these different things, all these different things that they might feel about our young people. And they don't even know how to interact with our young guys. So just like me with basketball, and I, I played basketball. I wanted to be a basketball player because I interacted with guys who were older than me that were basketball players that came back, that taught me, that pulled me up. We don't have that element of police thing where the police actually have relationships with the community members. And most of the time that's because the police officers that are policing our communities don't look like us. So they will have no understanding. For four years, I lived in Northbrook, and I met a guy, a white guy that lived in Northbrook that was a police officer. The first time he went into Chicago to become a police officer on duty was the first time that he actually had any interaction with any black person that wasn't the token black kid in their school. So when they see our young people with dreads, they see our young people loud, they see our people in these aspects, they look at them in a way. So... What I would say what needs to change is we have guys, Dion Butler is a Simeon alumni, he's a police officer, um, Sharetta Henderson. These people need to take on a leadership role and become the community, um, the bridges between the police department and the community. Because I would feel more, uh, I would feel better to trust them and more open to working with them than I would be with a white man that doesn't understand my plight. So I would think that's most importantly, the black officers that we do have, get out here and talk to your people and try to build a relationship and become the bridge between the community and the police officers that we need. Um, really quickly too, um, to, to piggyback off that, CPAC is actually an ordinance that's in the city council right now. Um, I think it's Civilian Policing Accountability Council, which okay. essentially would say that we would put um, a council of civilians on the police board and they would be the ones who would hire and fire police officers or when uh, situations like body cams show that mis- uh, in, impropriety is happening, then they would be the ones to handle that. Um, a lot of people have pushed for that. Other people have pushed for GAPA, where they say we should have half of the board should be civilian. The other half should be appointed by the mayor. Um, I personally like CPAC. Um, and I have we, it correct at the bottom of the screen, Kina, for people watching. They can, you see the little banner? Yes, correct. Okay, CPAC. so they can Google okay. CPAC and learn more about it. And we'll learn about it, yep. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, and I... To, I want to touch with both of you and kind of shift more now into the COVID part of things. But Tim, I think what you said about just needing to see it, are you needing to see that it's possible to see a, a black man in a police un uniform? That's OK. Um, and, and Kina, you're encouraging people to get involved with politics. And I think you're doing that by example. I think it's important that we note that Miss Collins here is the youngest black woman to run for Congress in Illinois. 
Uh, so clap it up for you. You thought I wasn't gonna bring it up, didn't you? So with that, so thank you, you know, for for living out what you say. Um, I do appreciate that. And to to kind of shift a bit. So we're we're living in a society where it's, it's clear um, black people, especially black men, but, but black women, were not respected. Um, we are demonized and criminalized before we've even committed a crime. <laughs> Um, and it makes me think of the example from earlier this month when state rep uh, Cam Buckner took to Twitter and talked about his experience leaving the grocery store. And he had his mask on, dressed like a regular guy at the grocery store. It's a Sunday afternoon. But a police officer randomly decided to stop him and ask him to prove the purchase, um, prove his purchase. Even after complying and doing that, he still asked to show his ID. And now the officer has to run his name and, and all this unwarranted stuff that you're like, for what? Um, but the sad reality is, as we're preparing to move into the next phase of reopening the state completely, and Chicago's a little bit behind on that plan per the mayor's order, and you know she'll give us a date soon, masks are a part of that. So as more of us are coming outside, as more young Black men are, are coming outside, they have to wear their masks around. How would you, and we can start with you, Tim, if you could could quickly touch on how, well, I, I think we get how it's scary. So not even so much how, um, but the, the type of extra awareness you say that they need, how do they stay that aware? How do they, what, just what words of encouragement, I guess is the best thing that you could give to someone who would clearly be frustrated being asked to prove their purchase for no reason, then still being asked to prove their identity and whatever else, or if it's the case, and, and Kina, this is maybe where I can have you jump in. Maybe this is a young guy done nothing wrong or, or has some sort of, you know, small scenario, maybe got a warrant because he didn't pay a ticket or something. So now this officer is taking him in or there's something there that escalates the situation. Um, when I get to you, if you could please talk about how to keep them calm or, you know, most of us don't have the resources to run and get a lawyer or to do whatever else. So, but Tim, the words of encouragement. I know it was a little lengthy. Sorry, guys. You want to go, Kina? You want me to take it first? Oh, I think she told you to speak first. Yeah, you go oh, ahead. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Um, like you said, because the first thing I was going to say is that's scary. I mean, we know that. It, it, it definitely is scary because I think that any wrong moves, any wrong actions can turn into anything with our young people out here with these masks on. Mask on. And I guess the, the easy thing to say is, you know what, don't try to be in a store and don't grab nothing and they not be able to see what's in your hands or do all of these different things. I think that's the easiest thing to do and tell them how to move. But what I would say more so importantly is try to stay in groups. This is one of those situations for me. I mean, I know that we don't want to be, they don't want to see us in groups, but I would say stay in groups because if you by yourself, they can say you did anything and then there's no proof behind what you did. Um, of course, we don't want them to be in groups downtown because we know how they treat it. We don't want them to be in groups all through our communities because we know how they treat it, by the police. But that would be the best course of action for us, I believe, right now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think this is a really great question and also segue into something that we need to be discussing in the COVID pandemic and just pandemics in general. It's the conditions of, and jails and prisons, too, right? That's a vulnerable population that we continue to forget about. Um, and why is that important? Because we're talking about health care. Um, mm -hmm. Cook County Jail is one of the largest mental health facilities in the country, not even just <laughs> in the state or state of Illinois, or the city of Chicago, but in the country. And so we've seen people get arrested strictly to get health care. And what I think the bigger question is, is, A, you want to stay calm in situations like that. Obviously, you don't want to you don't want to be trying to have that civil rights fight with the police right there because you're going to lose. That's just the that's just the facts. Um, once again, it goes back to us being proactive instead of reactive when these situations happen to young black men in our community. And let's not forget about young black women. We know that the policing that happens on the bodies of young black women are very gender specific. So what do I mean by that? I mean that young black, uh, black and brown girls are far more likely to be raped, molested, and sexually assaulted by police officers than any other demographic in this country. And that's a fact. Um, there's a case, Daniel Holtzloff in um, Oklahoma, who was a police officer who's sitting in jail for life right now for specifically targeting young women of color um, and sexually assaulting them. So we have to have these conversations as well, uh, broad strokes and comprehensive. 
So one, you want to stay calm. You don't want to have that that fight right there. Um, two, you want to make sure that you get the officer's badge number and, and uh, what precinct they work for so that you can report that. When we have profiling, racial profiling that's happening in our community, um, even though you stay calm in that situation and you live to walk away to tell the story, that doesn't mean that we the accountability stops right there. Okay. A lot of the times we don't report the, the misconduct of police officers who are brandishing guns, hitting people, pulling people over illegally, racially profiling, all of those things are constitutionally and federally illegal. And so we need to start taking their badge numbers down and reporting them um, to their supervisors. Um, and while we may not think that that has an immediate impact, what we see in these cases of these black men who die um, in police custody is that paper trail comes out about those police officers. So it's about building that paper trail and pointing that out uh, both to police boards, et cetera. Can and then finally, I think it's just, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, the only, only oh, thing I, I want to ask you is because, I mean, and anybody, any younger person that's watching this, what Ms. Collins just said is 100% right on how you should handle situations. I agree with you. My question to you would be, because I've had a situation like that where you say, well, go and, go and report. If you feel like you were mistreated, go and report it. I myself have had that situation on 74th and Carpenter. And I'm a positive guy, I work with our youth, I donate, I do all the things that you are supposed to do when you are somebody that's a quote unquote community leader or activist. And when I went to the police station, so I just want some, um, how, to, how to handle this situation. I went to the police office on 64th, 63rd and Justine to talk to the white shirt chief to let him know what happened. I video recorded everything. And his response to me was, you're not gonna tell me that he did this to you because of you being a black guy in this community. So just to give you a little background, um, I'm in a very nice car in a bad neighborhood dropping off a player i'm i mean at the end of the day I'm doing right. but because of me being in a nice car in this environment at this moment i was targeted pulled over pulled out of my car and treated this way how do you handle moments like that when you say deal with it the way that you said? such a good question such a good question so um number one is it's a process right so you go and report it you get the paperwork that it's been reported um, that's where this relationship with your alderman is also important because you're supposed to report it to them. And if things still don't happen and you don't get um, the response you want, you can take it to the inspector general. You can even take it all the way up to the state's attorney's office. Um, I think the point that I'm trying to make and drive home, because those things do happen um, in the community um, where you report and it doesn't, nothing happens from that. The point that I'm trying to make is that it's so underreported. We don't do it. We don't make it a practice. You can't go to Lincoln Park. A police officer can't go to Lincoln Park and do that. A police officer can't go to Rogers Park and do that because if it gets reported, then something actually happens. So I think the first step is actually reporting that those instances happen. And then it's also organizing in the community like you do, Tim. It's, it's going to the actual community stakeholders, letting them know that you did the right thing by reporting. And if we don't see action, we're taking it to the newspapers. We're taking it to the churches. We're taking it to the people in the community who, are, who stand at the vanguard. And so it's, it's taking that first initial step, uh, which I think I know in Austin on the West Side 15th District, we don't report enough yes. on the things that happen in our community. And so a lot of this stuff goes unchecked. Thank you. I, I think the biggest piece of, of what I'm taking away from what you're saying, Kina, is community. Like as a community, we have to report these things. And when it gets unnoticed as a community, we have to go to the newspapers and, and, and all of these things. Um, so before we wrap up this segment, because this is awesome, awesome content, I want to talk very quickly about the impact, um, and, and Tim, this is mainly for you, that schools being closed for the rest of the year, CPS out of school for the rest of the year. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen next school year yet, but the impact that something like that has on our youth, especially in under-resourced neighborhoods. Um, I understand that CPS gave out computers to kids who didn't have them, and you know, but that only goes so far. Um, and we all know that a lot of basic learning, a lot of, of children's learning styles, it starts at home. You know, you can have the best teachers, but you need your parents, you need good influencers at home to drive education home for you. So can you speak to um, schools not opening, but sooner than later, some parks will be opening back up, um, certain daycare facilities, some, some tips and tools for parents or even for youth that are watching that don't have that structure that they have with school. Um, how they can safely 
be productive and, and kind of get back out here into the world when the parks are officially open and things like that? Get out, have any opportunity you have to get out with your friends. The, the beauty of this pandemic lock in, lockdown to me and not being able to move around is that I feel like families have had to communicate and talk and deal with each other a little bit more. I think our, our young people have had to be around some of their parents more than they ever have. I think that that has been a great part of this from the guys that I deal with and I've had conversations with. Um, secondly, I would say if you have a neighborhood park, if you have a neighborhood field, get out, go play. I mean, I know that we are in and most of us are living in communities where it's very dangerous, but we cannot stay in the house and stay hold up and be scared and be fearful. If you feel like you as a young man are not safe going to your community park, go knock on your next door neighbor that might have a father or, or uncle or somebody that let them go to the park with you and try their best to keep things to calm down. I myself, when I did it um, at Murray Park, that was effective to me. When the young people wanted to get out there at Murray Park on 73rd, Coach Tim, I need to get out here and I need to work out. And by me being there, my presence as a man being there, we didn't have any fighting. We didn't have any shooting. So one of the main things that I would say is go find you men in your community, young women. Find you a friend on the block. Find you a woman that you can go and talk to and try to learn something from. Communication. I mean, find a way to communicate with somebody that can help you. I'll say that's the most important tip I can give. Thank you. Um, and, bef and before wrap up, I noticed that a few months ago you started a GoFundMe uh, for I Care Inglewood yeah. Business Incubator. Is that yeah. still a thing? It is. So actually, I have just um, King King um, Investment Industries is somebody that I just partnered with. They try to find funding for different programs and different organizations to try to become businesses throughout the city. Um, I just talked to the, the GM of that maybe like two weeks ago. It's still a thing for me. I, I have resources, but I wanted this to be a community driven thing. I want to give back to community. I want to hire community. I don't want to go. I mean, Cody, no, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have friends that are doing great things with their lives, but I want to be able to show them and these people care. And if I can show them that the community cares, I think that it will kind of, um, it would energize them to want to come back into our communities. One of the, the worst things that's happening in our communities is, you know, when our guys, our people, our community, when we make it out, it's the stigma. Once you get out, stay out. Yeah. And I don't think that we need to stay alone. This is another generation. This is a new generation. We're going into a new period of the world that none of our parents have ever seen. We got to do things differently. Don't be afraid to be that person that has properties that own homes on the neighborhood block in Inglewood. Don't be afraid to try to do that. So the Inglewood business incubator is me just trying to do that. It's just me trying to build. I'm having meetings in my communities with guys and saying, how can we pool our recesses together? How can we practice group economics on trying to build our community up? And, you know, it's a slow grind. It's a slow grind, but it's one I'm thankful that God chose me to go down that road with, though. Another example of, of leading by example and practicing what you preach. So I, I appreciate that um, as someone who was born and raised on the South Side. And if I get the chance, I ain't never leaving. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you trying to, to make positive impact. So I've shared it at the bottom of the screen. If you're watching, you all go to GoFundMe. This is what you need to search, donate. Um, I do have to keep it moving to get to the other categories, but Keenan and Tim, I want to thank you all sincerely for everything you shared. I hope that our listeners have written down the calls to action that they can take um, and, and take the theme from both of you really is community. Find a friend, find a mentor, find whoever you need and whatever you need to get through this. Thank, thank you all for joining. Y'all very dope, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stay blessed. Right. You too. So we're going to jump in to beauty and fitness i know everybody everywhere is like i can't wait for the gym to open <laughs> up and i can't wait to get my hair done and i need my nails done um so welcome help me welcome rather be hey, hair stylist hello Stewart. hi amber c warren warren cuts winnie todd what's up how y'all feeling how you guys doing feeling really good, good. today good. how are you I want how y'all feeling coming in um, so oh, we'll, yeah. good getting into it. Um, Warren, we can start with you. So, as I mentioned, from a consumer standpoint, we know everybody's excited to get back in a chair, get their haircuts, you know, guys need them linings. How are you feeling though? Um, outside of I'm sure you know, ready to get back to maybe the stream of income you know. What's your biggest concern with with sooner than later shops being able to open back up and clients coming in? 
figuring out the proper protocol to put in place. Um, you know, the team here is anxious to see what we're going to decide to do. And it's difficult because there hasn't been guidelines for us on exactly what to do. I've heard some salons are staggering um, shifts amongst mm -hmm. their staff, but that creates a problem in a sense where, you know, you may have someone who's a booth renter who, you know, might be taking a couple people at home right now. Why would they want to come back to the business if they can't work a full schedule? Because they can work a full schedule at home. So then that just this whole thing just presents a lot of new challenges uh, that we weren't expecting. That is one of the biggest ones is trying to just figure out what the appropriate plan of action is. And everyone's kind of creating that for themselves, but there is no right answer per se. Because at the end, of, and then at the end of the day, it, whatever precautions you put in place is only going to do so much because you have to. It's such a personal service. Yeah. You have to be right up on people. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if they cough, uh, you know, they cough and sneeze, the the mask has that. But if they have it, you know, these masks that everyone have is not the N95. It looks good to say that you're doing something, but it's not really preventing the disease from getting out. And I mean, if somebody needs their beard shaped up, they can't wear no mask for that. You know, how do you it, navigate around something like that? So some people are just denying that service. Okay. Yeah. So, but that doesn't really make the most sense. To, you know, guys aren't going to be walking out here with the naked face, I would hope. <laughs> well, you, some for everybody. But uh, BB, with you two being in a salon, I assume that you can relate to a lot of what Warren is saying. Um, and what does it look like for you all, first of all, to kind of jump back for a second. So we know that Illinois um, is set to move into phase three come two days from now, May 29th. However, Mayor Lightfoot has put in place that Chicago is not following along with the rest of the state. We won't be ready to open up salons and outdoor restaurants and gyms and all of these things until sometime early June. She still has not put a date on it. Um, so one, what was that? Was that kind of like a, a mixed emotion feeling for you? Like, were you excited to get back on May 29th? And then it was like, oh, wait, just kidding. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I didn't get too excited okay. because I knew that there was a possibility of, you know, them changing their minds or, you know, figuring that we need more time because it has happened before. I think it has happened twice already. Um, I've scheduled clients, canceled them, scheduled clients, canceled them. Um, so I wasn't too disappointed. However, um, I do think it will give me more time to get ready to get back into the salon. So okay. in that sense, I kind of felt like, okay, this is going to give me a little bit more time to confirm the things that I need to get done and make sure that I have um, everything that I need and also making sure that I'm communicating with my clients what's going on. And it's not like all rushed, you know? Yeah. What sort? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say one thing that Warren said that stuck out to me because obviously I'm a booth renter at, uh, at the time. And he's he's definitely right. Like I realized that one of the challenges, you know, being in the salon was going to be that it's, it's already six stations. We're not six feet apart. So the only other option we have is to do it in shifts, you know? Um, mind you, we already been off of work for, you know, so long. Mm -hmm. So it's like, dang, I got to cut hours when I get back to work? You know, that's not really ideal. Um, so I could definitely see what he's saying in that aspect because for me, that was, as a booth renter, that was a big concern of mine. And I actually did end up leaving the salon. I was at, as that being part of the reason. Okay. Um, the other reason, because I wanted to be able to control my own environment um, and just to create some more flexibility um, for the people that was at the salon and for myself and my clients. I think um, I'm sure there are some booth renters watching. So I thank you all for bringing up that point in that piece. Because 
again, as consumers, we get so excited and we miss being pampered, but we don't think about the effect that it has on you all, you know, as the service provider. And I was going to ask you, BB, to speak to maybe when you are back in the salon and ready to go, what sorts of sanitation measures should consumers um, expect to take or expect you to take when it's when it's time for people to start coming back in? Um, well, they can expect, well, I'll tell you what I already do, a few things that I don't have to worry about as far as changes being made. I already was taking clients on like a personal basis, so I didn't overbook. Everybody had their set time. So that's one thing that I don't have to change. Um, my clients are kind of already used to. Um, things that I will have to change is obviously taking temperature when they come in. Um, I did not sanitize the station thoroughly in the chair and stuff like that, but that's obviously something that I'm gonna have to implement. Um, so there will be gaps in between appointments so that I could have time to do that. They will also need to text or call when they arrived and I could kind of confirm that I finished up with my last client and they're able to come in. Um, what else? Disinfecting um, the capes. Um, I actually ordered a lot more capes, so hopefully I should have enough capes that each day would be enough for one each person and then I could take them home and wash them. Um, I didn't really want to do the disposable thing because I felt like that could get a little pricey. Mm -hmm. um, but besides that, I figured, you know, that will work long term. Um, what else are the things that we uh, came up with? If I can, while you're still thinking, jump to Warren. Do a lot of those sanitation measures kind of sound similar to what you all will be taking at the barbershop? Yeah, it, it pretty much was the exact same thing. Um, I'm going to schedule more time between clients now so I don't have to, one, to allow for additional sanitation measures, like she said, thoroughly, thoroughly, you know, disinfecting and spraying and wiping the seating down. That's something that's not really traditional and not necessary mm -hmm. normally to go to quite those measures. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you know, it's a much more sensitive time now and to cut out you know clients running into each other just giving myself a maybe a 30 minute break between clients gotcha so amber to kind of bring you into the conversation um i know that you have a business where you can still function you uh, it's her life and you sell the resistance bands um and promote yeah. fitness you know mainly through that so you've had i at least um, i assume it's safe to say um, a pretty fair stream of income from that because it's an online business. Would mm -hmm. I be expecting? Okay, I'm all right, cool. No, yes, 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 you're right. right. Um, so can you speak to maybe what you've learned in this pandemic being on that side of it? Like you don't have to give an in-person service, the importance of having extra streams of income or certain types of businesses? Yes, yeah, so, uh, well... At first I was working, I'm a, an internship with the Illinois Public Health Department and that income wasn't as big. So okay. I had to take a step back from them when they steered me here at home to work from home. So I'm still doing that. But I was able to capitalize a lot more being at home and actually focusing on my um, on my brand, being able to promote more, uh, going to backyard, create content and reach other people. I started offering online workout classes, which is weekly. So I do it through Zoom. So I'm still able to reach people that purchase vans and allow them to uh, teach them how to use them. So just giving them more for their money, if if, if you can say that. Gotcha. Um, I would say it's just been, I, it's been a blessing because at first my vans were kind of moving really slow and then everybody has been working out from home mm -hmm. and other people are selling vans. So when those run out or something, they come across my page and they're just buying them because everybody is working out from home. So having that extra income has really been a blessing. I'm trying to keep up the momentum. So even after everything opens back up and everyone is back to the normal schedule, I want to try to figure out how to continue to keep that revenue coming in and possibly just completely stop working for um, the Illinois Public Health Department. Gotcha. Can you um, briefly speak to 
what people should kind of expect gyms to look like when they do open. Because from what we know so far, when gyms are allowed to open at first, it will still be like crazy restricted. Only one on one training, very limited, small group outdoor class sessions. And for most of us, we're in Chicago. So that's only going to last for a couple of months while the weather's nice, you know. Um, so what do you think that will look like in what people should still be doing? Because for some people, they don't feel like at home workouts are for them. These Zoom classes is too much for them. You know, it just ain't working to 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 dumb it down. Um, so what advice do you have for them and just how to stay prepared for the worst? Um, I would say if like going to the gym is best for you, I would just suggest maybe doing the personal training one on one just so you can stay safe. I know for myself. I won't be stepping into a gym anytime soon. I actually really enjoy doing at-home workouts. And until the gyms are, like, basically saying that everything is, like, back to normal, everything is safe. Because even sometimes when I go to, like, L.A. Fitness or Planet Fitness, they don't have enough sanitizing wipes. And it can get it can make your workouts longer by constantly going to every single thing. I mean, going back mm -hmm. in a spray bottle, spraying everything down. And uh, it can just be... It's very difficult to be fit, I guess, at this time right now or just consistently working out. I would say just do what's best for you. So if personal training is something you'll have to look into and you wouldn't want to invest in your health, then go ahead and purchase um, services from a personal trainer. If you like Zoom classes and virtual workouts, if you like at-home workouts, but it is important that you figure out what works for you because your health is important. And the importance of diet, too, not only for fitness, yes. um, for your immune system, like for health, you know, like we're in the middle of a pandemic fighting against a virus. Best mm -hmm. thing that can help that is a healthy body. How do you want to try? I have a question. Can we hear yes, we can. Yes, I have a question. So, guys, I've, I've just, to, just to talk, um, I have been paying attention. I've just been taking my notes. Like I'm a student right now. Everything is just student. Like I want to make sure I get good notes. I want to make sure that we provide this information to the people after the panel. Um, one thing that stood out to me, um, BB, you said, um, Ms., I'm gonna call you Miss Curtis, that you said that uh, taking temperatures. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to know is was that like is that was that some type of guidelines that you guys were sent to your industry that you guys have to do this? Also. Um, within taking temperatures, we just talked about health. Um, if someone's temperature is not is is a little too high, with that, like, what's the proper protocol? You're not gonna take their money, or so, like, what's gonna happen in those situations? Okay. Um. Yeah, it was the guideline that was um suggested to us. I believe um, on it's on the city of Chicago website and the guidelines. I believe that may have been in there is one of the things that we should do. Um, as far as me and um, the salon that I'm in, we will have to turn around the guests, but I wouldn't take any, um, I don't feel like this is the time to, I, I would be lenient in my policies because obviously if you book with me and there's a late cancellation, I do charge a late cancellation fee. But with everything that is going on, I think that I would be a little bit more lenient um, in regards to that. So no, I wouldn't charge a, a fee. Okay. I'm sure the consumers appreciate that leniency because some people, no matter what's going on, we constantly see the viral videos of of service providers putting up, you know, concerned customers, texting them, asking them for a refund or for this or for that, given the circumstances. And they don't budge. Mm -hmm. um, so I applaud you for your good customer service. And I'm sure I mean, your clients appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, I have to be lenient because I don't have to be, but... It only made like my clients have been good to me thus far with this whole pandemic. Granted, they've been very many of them have been very anxious to get their hair done. Some of them may not understand why I'm still not taking clients like. Um, but even still, when I have scheduled them and I have to tell them, I'm sorry, I have to cancel your appointment. I thought we were going to be open. However, we're not there. They, they have still been understanding, you know, so I just feel like it's only right that I give that same courtesy, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I, just, I had to get this out because we, we were talking about controlling your environment. This is really stuck out to me because uh, I see a lot of people trying to get to these shops and it's for, you, for Warren or BBI can chime in on this. Um, when it comes down to controlling your environment, um, what is, what is y'all, what are y'all mindsets of like 
I know you. I know this affect y'all economically, but what about y'all health? Do y'all get scared at all when it comes to like yo trying to get these clients still on these pandemics or like letting these people into y'all home? Like, how, what is that? Can you take me through y'all mindset? Okay, you mind if I start more? Uh, you, you can take okay. it. For some reason, uh, I don't, I'm not getting BB's audio. Everybody else is good now, but hers cut out on my end. Uh oh. Oh, can okay. you hear me? So she, no. She could take the lead on the question and just let me know how oh. to follow up. Okay. Can okay. y'all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> um, dang, you said some part of your question that sparked. Repeat the question one more time. So basically, you you talked about controlling your environment. So I know mm -hmm. that you need you need the funds. So you know we know you need the funds because the pandemic is hurting you economically. But like, what is your mindset of, uh, when in regards to your health? Like you don't, like you letting these people around these people can be carriers. Like when we take us through that mindset and what type of things that you are doing that other people in your profession, they can take those uh, same precautions. Like, uh, because is this affecting your mental health at all? Like, like, like take us through the mindset of you every day still trying to, you know, to support yourself, support your family. So I will say um, when the order first was given, um, I did not feel anxiety because I thought it was only going to be for like two weeks or something, right? So in reality, I was kind of happy because I felt like I needed a break. Um, so then those two weeks went by um, and then it was extended a month. At that point, I began to feel anxiety. And then I contemplated whether or not I should take clients in my home or not. Um, and the contemplation was like so real that I had never really had to make a decision like that within my business to the point where I really couldn't find the answer because for me, it was like, okay, you have bills to pay. Um, and this is, was my main, this is my main source of income. Granted, I have other streams, but this is my main source of income. So it, it make a big difference. So for me, it was like, do I have that hustler mentality where I'm just going to, I'm going to figure out a way or am I going to think of this as my business um, on a bigger, on a bigger scale and realize that my business is bigger than me. So it's like, I think for me to have taken clients in my home would be like a little bit selfish. Um, and this is just my opinion on me. Um, because I'm trying to build like a brand in a business. Um, so when I thought about that, I thought about like bigger, um, national brands, like for instance, Apple, you know, I thought about them, like, are they still taking customers? No, they close they, their stuff down, you know, morally, they want to do the right thing. So I will be honest. I did take one client in my house and she was a very close friend of mine. However, I still did not feel comfortable with it. Um, and I did have a few clients scheduled after that. But after that one client, I messaged them back and told them that I couldn't do it because I just didn't feel right. One, it being my household, you know, and two, I hadn't worked out of my home in about like four years. Um, and I thought that one, I wasn't pressed for money. So it was just like, okay, you're not even in survival mode yet. So like, at least, you know, stretch it out. You know, you gotta see how it's gonna work before you just, um, you know, decide to make that move. So honestly, it's been great ever since then. Like I haven't been taking any clients to anything. I just focused on other ways to make income, which was like with my online store and things of that sort. So I would pretty much tell people to focus on what you can control and not the things that you can't control. Um, and that's been very beneficial for me. Um, like I'm not, I'm not living in fear or anything like that. I'm just doing what I can. I'm thinking forward. Like I'm very excited. I'm very excited about where the industry is going to go. Even though it's like a crisis right now in the industry, I think the industry is still going to be resilient. The interface may change, um, but I think overall the industry is still going to be resilient. And for me, this was like, personally, it was a shift for my mental and it was a shift in my business. The ideas that I had already came up with for my business, um, this was just a shift like, okay, it needs to happen. Like you see, like you see the problems now, here's how to solve them. Um, 
so yeah, it's, the quarantine for me has really been like a positive thing. And like I said, initially I was feeling anxiety about like financials and like, I got to work. Um, but then I had to think about it. I know people that's been in way worse circumstances when it comes to financials. Granted, this was like literally at the end of March. So I really hadn't felt any, any negative feelings of financials at that time. So I just pushed it out and I made it happen. So it's been going pretty good for the most part. Yes. A lot of gems dropped in the answer. Definitely. I think um, the biggest takeaway is the the alternate streams of income, focusing on what you can control. And I wanted you all to speak to that, which you already did, so that um, other entrepreneurs that are watching know how to handle it when a crisis comes. So Warren, would you like to bring us home and just quickly answer Cody's question? Um, do you have fear or, or for your own health or concern getting back into things when once the day is announced? Can you hear me now? Warren? I think he just muted his mic for a moment. No, it's it's not muted. Warren, can you hear us? Are you guys speaking to me? Yes, yes I am, sir. Can I'm you hear me? I'm not hearing any audio. Uh oh. I just switched and put headphones in and took them out. I warned mess up the whole production. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, can you hear us now? Before I, just I had somebody laughing real quick. Okay, I'll try. Y'all, you guys can hear me fine. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, I can hear you, Amber. I think Amber's the only person I can hear. If you guys could just say something, then I don't know. Warren, can you hear me? I can't hear you, Cindy. Can okay. you hear me? Well, how about this? How about we let Warren try to figure out? Just, can you hear me now? Hear you now? Okay. So I was just asking you to quickly answer Cody's question because we got to get moving to the next segment. Um, do you have just any sort of fear of concerns for your own health and your own livelihood as we approach the day where you can open back up? I'm not too concerned about it, but what I will say is I don't feel that there are any, the masks aren't really a, a, a proper precaution. It looks good, but it's just more so a, a facade. And, you know, a lot of people, are not honoring the social distancing laws anyway, you know, and if you're going to start taking clients, you have to realize that, you know, just because they come in with a mask, you know, a mask on that again is really not that protective because it's not, which we all already know in 95 is more of just like a fashion statement thing or, or simply just because it's a requirement, but it's not stopping the spread of the, uh, virus. Like, that the 95 is um you're gonna expose yourself so if you're that concerned about it i don't think there is a social distancing guideline that would suit you you need to either not take clients or just understand that you're gonna be at risk to contract right. the disease i don't i don't think there are guidelines that's gonna really protect against it like that I appreciate that honesty, um, and I'm, I'm certain you're not alone in that viewpoint at all. Um, but for the sake of at least doing the bare minimum we can do, I personally still encourage everybody to wear the mask because um, I do see Warren's point for sure. But I, I'm a firm believer in some better than nothing. Um, but I that's true. But in, in my profession, I'm not to cut you cut you off. Uh -huh. You're gonna have to take the. If I'm gonna service you, I'm gonna have to ask you to take the mask off anyway. So it's like you you either work or you don't really. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you still you still of course practice procedures. You know, something is better than nothing for sure. But you're still gonna be at some kind of risk. Cause they don't want to come in and get that line and not get the beard trimmed up, right? <laughs> you gotta look good all over for the ladies or you know whatever you got going on so but i just i, I wanted to end on a light note thank you all so much for your input um i know our real estate and finance panelists are are waiting to get in here and drop some gems amber thank you so much i hope everybody stays fit um thank look you. into it's my life get those bands for y'all home workouts bb yes. we wish you all the best as you approach opening back up 
Um, and Thank and you. I hope your your clients comply with whatever standards you all set so that you can get the ball rolling. Thank Sounds you. Thank good. You guys Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. All right. So moving, getting into it, let's bring in the infamous Downing Brothers, Mrs. Kanji Barnes, and Ross Mack. How are you all this evening? Doing awesome. Thank you so much for your patience. I appreciate it. Appreciate you all. Um, so getting into it, I know... Actually, all of you, even Ross, I've seen you even speak on on real estate in the housing market a bit. Um, so I want to put it out there. One of the the biggest things I keep seeing people talk about on social media is they are certain that the housing market is going to drop and they can't wait so they can grab them some properties. Um, so if we could start with the Downing Brothers. Can you all speak to that? Uh, do you think that this idea is a sensible one to have right now? Should people be excited? I think uh, I think people should be excited, but I think they should temper their expectations because there is um, there the, the inventory is low right now. There's not a bunch of property out there because some people are withholding because of the pandemic. Some people aren't placing their properties up for sale. Um, and you know, there's various other factors, but the inventory is low. So, I mean, you do the best you can, you look for what you can and get the best opportunity, but I, but I think people need to be patient. Okay. And I, and I would say this also, every time that there's a recession, you know, there are gonna be winners and losers. And, and so when the first wave of foreclosures come through, it's time to scoop them up and get them back, you know, on the tax roll and get them back in play. Ponji, do you have anything to add? I totally agree. I, I've been advising people that they should be preparing. So that means like if you need to fix your credit, that's what you need to be working on. If you need to be saving for a down payment, you need to be speaking to a lender. When you see a good deal, it is not the time to get on the phone with a lender and say, hey, I need financing to get this property. You need to have all your ducks in a row now. So that's basically I'm preparing for it. And I always tell other people, get your ducks in a row, find out what you need so you can qualify when that time does does happen. So. OK, so I know, um, Ponji, to stick with you for a second, you have the book Real Estate and Chill. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the topics you cover in it are tenant management and tips on buying property. So to start with tenant management, tenant management, excuse me. Um, unfortunately, because of this pandemic, some people are just gonna have to move. They're gonna have to become a, a tenant elsewhere. It's just not, they can't avoid it. In such a, a scary time, because it's scary for the homeowner or the, the property owner as well, who'd be renting to them. How does one make themselves appear to be the ideal tenant? Um, as far as being able to screen now during the pandemic. Correct. How do I, um, with all this going on, how do I still get you to let me live in your property? Yeah, there, there's definitely going to be some extra layers of screening because we want to make sure that the person has a stable job. And during this time, a lot of people are getting laid off or furloughed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So now it's an extra step. Before it was taking me like two months to actually screen <laughs> because I'm just that careful with my screening process, like probably add another two weeks on that. So um, I would definitely say, first of all, you need to be, you know, um, verifying the person's income, calling the employer. I know even some lenders, uh, when before you're able to close on the property, they're calling two hours before you close to ensure that you actually still have a job. So probably adopting some of those same requirements that people are, you know, the banks are requiring for mortgages, probably, you know, adopting some of those same things as a landlord, just to make sure that, you know, on my side of the, the um, that I'm making sure that this person can actually pay because nobody wants to go through an eviction. It's very costly. Mm -hmm. It is very, um, you know, time consuming and no one wants to be the bad guy to have to throw someone out in the street. So for us, we've been, you know, using compassion with our tenants, working with them. Um, for one of our tenants, we even allowed them to get away with, you know, not paying rent until June 15th because they have been there for five years. And she's such a, you know, she's been such a good tenant. She she takes care of the place. And we've just been, you know, compassionate about her situation. So 
Um, we try to give as much leniency with people that have been there long term as much as we can. But with new tenants, you obviously have to make sure you're protecting yourself. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Um, and I think that one of the biggest pieces that I hope anyone who is a landlord that's watching um, understands is the compassion part. But at the end of the day, it's, it's also still a business. So I do. I think balance is the key there. Absolutely. So you've covered how landlords can protect themselves, what the tenant should do um, to, you know, just be the, the ideal tenant in a pandemic, if that even exists. Um, jumping back to the Downing Brothers, can you all, are there any specific tips? Like I know you said in general, like, yes, if the market goes down and that first wave of floor closures hits, be ready. But what are some key tips, maybe like your top two you would give a person or even specifically um, a first time property buyer for when that time comes, what, what, are, what do they need to have? What do they need to do? Well, I mean, I always want to stick to the basics. And some of the basic things is, do you have, is your credit as high as it possibly can be? And is your cash in the account in season? Meaning like, you, like you've like you had it more than 30 days, more than 60 days. Is your money sitting in your account? And are you ready to pull the trigger um, when an opportunity comes? Um, and do you already have a relationship with a mortgage lender uh, so they can even create a file for you so that... Um, you know, that they can, you know, lock in the interest rate for you or just being prepared. Like at the end of the day, this is real simple. Do you have the credit and do you have the capital? And can you actually, you know, um, you know, send a digital copy off to the mortgage lender so that you can, you know, execute the deal and be able to get a property on the contract. And, and they need to have awareness that under the current federal, you know, guidelines, somebody can come into your property right away and can go 12 months without paying rent. And then at the end of that time, they still get 30 more days before you can uh, push them out of the property and they'll get a judgment and you're still not going to get paid. So, you know, back to what, what Ponji is saying, it, I mean, it's very important to consider all of these things. Yeah, I guess it, 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 he, he's talking about if you buy a multi-unit uh, property, mm-hmm. um, because, I mean, you could be getting a single family home. You could be getting that property for yourself. Um mm-hmm. Hey, it was it was <laughs> kind of it, we talking about the forbearance. There was a, a, no, I can't remember what it was. I was gonna say, never mind. <laughs> it's okay. If you remember, just let me know. Um, we have a question in the comments. Would you rent to someone who got laid off because of the pandemic, but consistently collects unemployment for the time being? Panji, can you can you speak to that first, and then we'll jump back and <laughs> oh, uh, that's a hard no. Hard, no, hard 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 no. No. Yeah, um, that's temporary income. So what are you going to do afterwards? So I, I can't rent to you based on those those circumstances. That's um, no, because it, I need long term. Like when I when I'm typically screening, I look for two years or more that you've been on the same job. So I can't, you know, rent to you based off of unemployment. No. Mm-hmm. It's not Section 8. I mean, it's federal money, but it's not the same federal money. It's not the same. Right. Thing. right. Okay. Well, sticking with the unemployment thing, Ross, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, you have a tweet that you also shared to your Instagram, and you said unemployment is 15%. This was as of May 8th, so I'm, the numbers may be different now. Don't be trying to tar- charge his credibility. But as of May 8th, unemployment was 15%, the highest it had been since the Great Recession. Yet the stock market is still going up. Why? One reason and one reason only. Don't fight the Fed. I noticed you got a lot of people asking you to clarify what you meant by don't fight the Fed. And I know that you did. But could you do it here for us on the platform to help people understand a little more? Yeah, absolutely. So what that means, one, thanks for having me. But two, what that actually means is the Fed is the federal government, the bank, the Federal Reserve. Right. So the bank. So I'm sorry, the United States has their own bank, that being the Federal Reserve. And with that, they have the ability to print unlimited supply of money. And so right now, when you have anytime you turn on CNBC and they're saying, you know, there's going to be a second round of stimulus, you know, is there going to be this or that? Understand that that is the federal government, the Federal Reserve um, effectively pulling every lever they can in order to ensure that our country doesn't go to shambles. Right. Mm -hmm. And you got a lot of other things that are going on. Um, But one of the biggest things is what I was saying was like what what you have right there is the stock market is being supported. There's a lot of inflation in the market. 
um, due to the fact that, you know, the the government is buying up assets, you know, um, treasuries, uh, they're buying, you know, bonds. And what that means is there's only one place that the stock market can go from there and it has to continue to go up. You know, this, you know, pumping a lot of money supply into the economy is good for the stock market. Gotcha. So can you speak a little bit more to the stock market? Um, we we saw when the the stay at home orders came out, this big plummet um, and it, it, it's coming back. It's recovering. We know the stock market can be unpredictable anyway. But just talk a little bit about what you expect it to do. And for those that are interested in investing in stocks, especially as we start easing out of restrictions and life returns to normal. Um, mm -hmm. I hope everybody sees the air quotes because it won't ever be the same. You know, what what can what should people have on their minds as they're trying to invest? I think um, I think you brought up some great points. The stock market itself is something that is going to always be uncertain. Right. It's something that at the end of the day to a common person, it's hard to actually understand. But one thing that I can say with great certainty, judging from over the past hundred years, is that the stock market always goes up. Right. And so. No matter what happened, if it was the dot com bubble um, in 2000, if it was 2008 or whatever it is, anytime you look at, you know, history where there's been some large pandemic or, you know, just something that calls the stock market itself to trade down a lot. One thing that I'm always able to say with great certainty is that the stock market is going to go up. And so one thing that I try to tell a lot of people that, you know, follow me is that, you know, I understand that it can seem, you know, intimidating at first, but understand that you're not making money by so one thing I, I look at it two ways for a person that that is on a brink of like man i want to you know start investing mm -hmm. first thing i'm going to tell that person is what are you doing right now right okay you have your money in your bank account understand right now due to inflation you're losing money every day so it's hard to understand but understand that when we were going to the corner store as a kid you can go in with with a dollar and get four bags of chips now you go in a corner store you get one bag of chips that's what inflation is, right? And the same thing's happening with everything in the economy. So the cost of all goods go up on average two to three percent a year. And so understanding that if you have a hundred dollars today, effectively your hundred dollars is only going to be worth ninety seven, ninety eight dollars next year. And so that's what inflation means. And so what I tell a person is like, look, understand this might seem, you know, puzzling at first, but what you have to do is understand that your money is losing money, just leaving in the bank account. And as a result, and the reason I say that is because mm -hmm. the bank account is going to give you 0.1% interest rate, right? You put your, you put a thousand dollars in there, you look up, they might've gave you a dollar, $10, right? Over a year. And what I'm saying is that you would be better suited putting that money in a stock market. Um, and not saying all of your money in the stock market, because there is risk associated with it. However, over the long term, your money invested in the stock market, you're going to get on average 10% returns. And I preach this every day to people, you know, um, relatives, friends, family, just like, look, you know, understand that there's a there's something, the eighth wonder of the world called um, compounding interest. And that's when your money's being invested, the interest you're making. Now that interest is now making more more money, interest mm -hmm. on interest. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so to so anybody who's, you know, who's watching, who's uh, effectively kind of on the fence about investing, whether it's real estate or, you know, the stock market, understand that. uh a good portfolio would probably include both. Um, but understand that there's very small barriers to entry when it comes to owning a stock. You can go buy a stock tomorrow. Um, uh, granted, you have a brokerage account, but you can literally go buy a stock tomorrow. There won't be a credit check or anything like that. And, and what I what I want our community to do is be better with our money, be better with budgeting, but more importantly, understand the value of allowing your money to make more money for you. So whether it is real estate or equities and bonds or things of that sort, you need to start investing because you're losing money right now by not investing. That's a fact. Basically the keeping your money in your mattress is not effective. That is not a At real all. bank. How some of us were taught, huh? At all. Okay. At all. So your bank account is literally the mattress these days. <laughs> not mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to Ross's point though, Oh, okay. I see it's right. not. It's not making any money there, because there's no interest. In exactly. That. Exactly. You tell us all the time about how much money they're, they're they're packing away into their bank account. When I'm like, okay, but you are going to go buy a building with that pretty soon, right? It's not. 
You're not gonna sit here ten yeah. years from now and tell me you, that same money is sitting there doing nothing. Yeah. Great point. I, I had missed what you said at first. I was like, I don't got my money in mattress, but I get it. <laughs> Thank you for reiterating that. Thank you so much. Um, and I know Ross, so we heard from Ponji, we heard from Downing Brothers, and you have a video on your social media. You agree with them as far as the housing market is going to go down, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so they, 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 sorry, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. My bad. Go ahead. I, I didn't know. I oh, yeah, no, I was, I was agreeing with them, and I think Ponji said amazing points about what you need to be doing in the meantime. And I do believe, like they say, it's a lack of um, inventory. And I think that, you know, to the people that are waiting on the sidelines, can't wait to another 2008 scenario happen. Um, I don't know if it's going to be as big as 2008, but I do believe after, you know, the government allowed people to forbear their mortgages, uh, don't have to pay rent and, um, you know, they don't have to pay it, whether it's from 180 days or an ex another extended 180 days. But after that forbearance period, I do believe there will be a wave of, foreclosures. And I think that's a great point and all of you all are in alignment on it. So I wanted to ask, um, I know typically people look for when they're trying to invest money or they're trying to buy these properties, they're looking for resources to help them do it. So from my understanding, one a resource could be maybe like a first time home, home buyer's loan or something like that. Do you all expect anything to change with the policies of these resources? Uh, because of the the situation we're in, you know, it's not a regular housing market. When it gets to the point where it goes down, will banks begin to change certain policies? Will the first home buyer's loan even still be a thing? What can people expect around that? And we can start with the Downing Brothers. Oh, well, I, I think the federal government is going to continue to try to stimulate the economy by making it easy for first time home buyers. The only thing is, there's going to be a, a, a shrinking of the human inventory as far as people who have jobs, have money, have credit mm -hmm. to be able to take advantage of, you know, the, the federal housing authorities, you know, at, you know, loans, the FHA loans. Um, but I think the government is going to make sure that those programs are still in place, though the private banks, they're going to be, just, you know, making it a little bit more difficult to, to get loans from them. Right. But then when he says private banks, he's talking about hard money. Cause for instance, if they're, they're raising, uh, the amount of capital that you have to put into uh, a renovation to fifty thousand dollars, where where it, at a, there was a time where it just needed to be twenty five percent down, but well, well, he's talking about private. I was more so talking about uh, banks like Chase, Bank of America, though uh, banks uh, that aren't necessarily backed by uh, you know uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You mean the conventional loans, right? So conventional loans, th those would be more difficult, but. Those that are uh, like a penny Mac mortgage, which is backed by, uh, you know, uh, Freddie Mac, those loans will still be available. The only thing is there'll be less people who can take advantage of them. Gotcha. Ponji, do you mind sharing? And then we'll hear from you, Ross. Um, I agree with them that you, they're still going to have the availability of FHA. Um, however, I do think that you are starting to see some banks put their own their own overlays in there. Meaning that, you know, your local bank, like a Chase or a Bank of America, they might say, OK, well, FHA says that you can do we can do a 560. But we're saying you have to have 600 to do that FHA or mm -hmm. we're saying that you have to have this much in reserves. So I think that you will st start to see like they want you to have more reserves. Um, to actually close these loans, higher credit scores and things like that. So I do um, anticipate that. And I've seen that already from people inboxing me and telling me that they have changed the requirements on in the middle of them getting a loan. So I definitely think that is going to be the future. Um, but those FHA loans will see, still be available. Um, and also just like grants and things like that. I think, you know, you'll still have those first time homeowner grants that they have available to help you with closing costs and things like that. The conventional side, I think, is going to be a lot more difficult for people to get a loan. Gotcha. So that's good news for people who are interested in. Ross, would you like to add anything? I think they touched on all the great points. Okay. Um, nothing really much to add. They did a phenomenal job. Appreciate that. <laughs> Cody? All right. So, yeah, like I, every panel, every discussion, I like I said, I've been here quiet. I'm a student of the game. I've been here taking notes. So well, uh, what I want to uh, just bring to the table is, is that from what I'm getting from everybody here, what y'all saying is, is that this is a time to prepare to pull the trigger, not save your money. It's but to pull the trigger. Like, nod your head. Yes. No. It's like, you know, just put, um, so 
for the consumer, for the regular guy, for the person that everything that you're speaking about is just strictly it's, it's Spanish to them. They don't understand anything. Well, what would you say we just in simply layman terms? Can you give your your first three steps uh, that people need to take? I think the first the first step in, in buying property is to actually go to a lender and find out where you stand. You know, there's this thing called uh, and uh, uh, was analysis paralysis. And I feel like a lot of people will constantly take notes and want to come to all these seminars that we throw and whatever and never get around to finding out where they stand. And then they find out that they could have bought a property two, three years ago. So let's go to a lender and find out where you stand. Right. I mean, the lender is going to educate you and say you that they, that they need you to have a bank account, that you have to have X amount of dollars in it. Um, they'll even take a look and say, oh, if you have your, your, your last couple of pay stubs, they can have an idea, an estimate of what your buying power would be based on that last two tax returns. Tax returns. So basically what we're going through is that lender will give you a list of all the financial documents that you need to have because you may not have a clue what you need to be able to bring to the table. So that mm -hmm. lender can tell you all the things you need. And then you go back and do your homework and gather all those items. Hopefully you had those things digitally on your in your email or on your laptop or whatever. But it's just knowing what you need so you can be prepared to, to, uh, to show those statements. OK. I completely agree. I think you have to start with the lender. I, I get that same question so many times. And like they said, you have people that will listen to every podcast. They will go to a ton of network for real estate, all these meetings. They will talk about it endlessly, but they won't pull the trigger. So the first thing you need to do is go and talk to your lender and see what you need to do to qualify. It's easier than you think. It's, it's not a hard process. It's not rocket science. But take the first step if you're really serious and you're not just playing around and wasting people's time. The first step is to call and make an appointment with the with the mortgage broker, a loan officer to see if you qualify. And if you don't, what you need to do to get qualified. OK, now Rob, speak on the money side. What's, what's the first step I need to do? Well, not I think, speaking for the consumer, not me personally, but like for the people. <clears throat> yeah, no, Um, I mean, I think. And I do a lot of videos on this. And I think the very first thing any person that's trying to, um, you know, get in, get interested in, get started in the investment game is right now for anybody watching, just open up another browser and go to etrade.com, right? And this is a brokerage account. This is how you're going to be able to buy a stock. Um, and I think the very first step is opening that up. It's going to be very simple. Um, you're going to ask you all your personal information. And then from there, you're going to be open. Then after that, you're going to fund that account. Um, and then from there, you know, now it's, now it's about what is the first stock I can buy, right? And I think you have to then assess your own situation, right? And I, I tell a lot of people, I don't recommend going out buying stocks if you have three, $4,000 in credit card debt, largely because you're paying about 20% interest rate on your credit cards. And therefore it doesn't make sense, right? Like I said earlier, um, the average return in the stock market is going to be about 10%. Sure, they're going to be great uh, years. Like last year was up 30%. Um, and then call it two months ago, the stock market was down 30%. And obviously it's since, you know, rebounded a lot. But understand over the course of a long term, the average is going to get you 10%. So, you know, open up that brokerage account. But then before you really, you know, buy that first stock, make sure, you know, you're good. Make sure that, you know, you know, don't have high interest bearing credit card debt. Make sure you get you know, uh, emergency funds stacked up three to six months of expenses. And then, you know, you good, you good to, you know, start investing. I think for a first time and first time buyer of stocks, I would, I would tell you to buy um, an index. So an ETF, you know, which is going to give you a lot of diversification. That's going to give you um, a larger barrier to be wrong. Right. And what I mean by wrong is just like, oh, I didn't necessarily, oh, I should have chose this airline company over that airline company. I should have chose this retail over that one, owning an index is an entire basket of goods that owns several different other stocks. And so that that would be my step to a person. I appreciate that. I'm pretty sure the people that's listening and watching this is probably going to appreciate all the information y'all just dropped. I just, I just want to say, one of the first stocks I ever bought was Twitter. Because when Twitter fingers got, got into the presidency, 
I was like, oh, you know, people are really be going to be using Twitter. And I'm about to unload it. Uh, I'm waiting like a couple of days, but I'm going to unload it at around like 5.2, 5.3% up from where I bought it like a year, a year and a half ago, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a great legit. point. You have to you have to watch what's going on in the world. Like you said, you knew when such and such got in the presidency, it would, it would be a thing. <laughs> say his name, but I hear you though. I hear you. <laughs> I'm trying, okay. Um, so before we wrap up this segment, I would like to Ross direct a comment question to you, um, and then I have a quick question for everyone. Uh, we have a comment that says, "What about money markets?" So Ross, can you touch on maybe yeah. what they mean? Yeah. Yeah, really quickly, money markets is is short term lending. So what you're doing is effectively a money market account is they're taking your money and they're loaning that to the government. And as a result, you're getting a much higher interest rate. You're getting a higher return than your bank account. But it's still, you know, probably one, two percent. So I do like money markets if, you know, you have other investments, but there are also going to be other you know, investments are going to yield higher than that two, three percent or less than that now because the 30 years, one point six percent. So to be honest, money markets probably getting you, you know, one percent if that. Um, but um, that is a much better option than just having your money in a uh, typical conventional savings account. Gotcha. Um, so with that, I know you mentioned E-Trade and, and encouraging people to log on and, and just familiarize themselves. Are there any other um outlets or apps like i know a lot of people use robin hood to invest yeah, robin. Any others? we use robin hood yeah okay. robin so are there any you would you know um recommend or prefer over the others well yeah, i I'd like robin hood oh, i'm sorry go ahead no 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 absolutely okay. go i like robin hood because it's really simple and my kids are using it so what we did was when the pandemic happened we were at home and me and my husband challenged our kids to think critically and we said well, it's a pandemic and the economy is going down. Well, what do you think is making money at this time? And so we had them like think of different streaming services and other things that were, were actually making money because mm -hmm. we were still buying mm -hmm. V-Bucks. Um, he bought Nintendo stock because they like video games and it actually has went up because people are buying. So we made our children make it fun. So now yeah. they can invest in their favorite brands and they can look on their little iPads every day and see what their stock is. So we tried to, like you said, Ross Mack, basically balancing their portfolio. Here's some real estate, here's some stock. Like you can get wealthy off both of them, but a healthy um, combination is kind of what we're trying to teach our boys. That's I, amazing. I, yeah, I applaud that. Yeah, that's that's right, yeah. talk right there. Yeah. <laughs> for real, for real. Thank yeah. you. Um, and to wrap up to either Ponji or the Downing Brothers, you both mentioned starting with a lender. So for a person who may not be familiar with where to go or how to find the best lender, should they go to the bank? Do they get on Google? What do they do? Um, I would suggest that you go to the bank where you actually bank at. So if you bank at Fifth Third Bank or you bank at Chase or whatever, you can go to that um, banker. Maybe also if you don't, maybe you can talk to a real estate agent that can kind of point you in a direction of a lender um, that they trust that can help you in that situation. But I always tell people to start with their local bank. I think that they're familiar with you. You have a, a banking relationship with them already. So I, I would start there. Well, we transparent have <laughs> our partners. We, we have guarantee a rate partner. Yeah, we okay. guarantee rate. Um, yeah. They do a lot of work for us, vice versa. So guarantee rate is um, is where we point people. And, and the thing about guarantee rate too is it you know they, it, it's almost like a broker. So there's different. They they'll find the appropriate um, product that you need. Yeah, product or mortgage. You know for your situation. Gotcha. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, before I move on to the next group, I just want to say, um, Ponji, especially thank you for sharing the part about your kids. And I know that uh, Ross, you rap and you include all these financial tips and investment tips and everything in those raps. So I also strongly encourage everyone watching to look that up because I think that um, me personally, I feel like one of the best ways to teach people is to entertain them. So if I can be entertained and I can relate to how I'm receiving the content, it's going to stick a whole lot better. And because the theme of this is moving forward is what to do next and how do I learn more? I just want to share that resource with everyone watching.
Um, so I hope that was okay. Thank you. Well, one last thing I want to add, please. Um, for Bonji. So we we have um a podcast. We've actually featured yes. both Bonji and Ross Mack on our podcast, yes. Homecoming with the Downer Brothers. You can find on Apple, Spotify, everywhere else. And then we also have a comic strip. If you go to our Instagram page, the Downer Brothers page, we have a comic strip that actually goes through the entire process. So as each step, each buy a property, right. yeah, to, to buy a property. So you can check that out also. And if you go and check out the podcast, uh, check out the episode. I cannot remember her name, so please forgive me. But the sister, um, part of the Luster family, that's my favorite episode. Oh, yeah, Lisa, so Lisa. If you have a listener. In oh, I should, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it, was, it was very relatable. Yeah, so, a, a so ring ring. Real estate and chill, support, support black businesses. <laughs> Thank you yeah. all so um, much for joining oh, me. Can I just add one more thing too as well? Yeah. You want, if you're interested in real estate, you can pick up my book, Real Estate and Chill on Amazon.com. And also I have an entire children's series on entrepreneurship. So one of our books is Riley, the Real Estate Investor, and that teaches children about real estate investing. Um, that book was actually featured in Crane, Chicago. We have Robert, the Real Estate Investor, yes. and just a ton of other ones. But you, if you want to check out the books, they're on littleowners.com. And they're great for this time where children are at home and it's non-traditional education that they can start learning about the basics of financial literacy. So start them awesome. now. Yeah. And then one, and I'm gonna do one quick plug. Okay, last um, plug. Once, yeah, um, guys, if you're interested in obviously following, um, you guys are already taking the first step by being here and joining us. So one, thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Cody Mac. But also, uh, you know, follow me. Um, I do a weekly, um, a weekly segment with Revolt TV. Um, also, you can subscribe to my newsletter at MrMacAnomics.com. MrMacAnomics.com. And then uh, we need Cody Mac to go ahead and put that Ross Mac in the. Uh, Top top twenty five, you know, you know the what's the word artist? I've been looking, I've been I've been right. looking at the list. I ain't seen me, so we got to do that. Go listen to Macanomics one hundred and one. Yeah. All right. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you having us. Right. Thank, much you. Thank you. We appreciate y'all, man. Y'all real dope. I yeah. think um, the mention that Ross just made of the list for um what's the word in, in the entertainment industry brings us perfectly into the next segment uh in the last segment um for those of you watching still hanging out with us entertainment management and media um hey guys hello how are you Mayha? what up hello. what up what up what up hey, Nate, it's hurricane thank you all for joining us Thanks for having yo, us. Yo, yo, I'm here. What's up? What's up? Hey, I Thanks feel like I know it's, you know, I appreciate y'all hanging in there and being patient. Everybody's good? Hey, hey man. Yes. You've had some wonderful guests. You can't hear me? I think so. Hey, man. Hey, man. Yes. Can I get your autograph? Boy. <laughs> <laughs> a mess. Hey, entertainment. entertainment is going to be lit. Oh my yeah, I, I would get to that feeling. We already asking for autographs and everything else. Yeah, um, and, and so, I need to get a picture with Nathan. <laughs> Come on, man. man. You're the famous one out here, man. Come on, where right. we came? No, no, no. Don't <laughs> right. start that mess. <laughs> there we go. No, no, no. no hey, look. Well, we got it. We got everybody out here. Here we go. Let me. Miss Love. Check my list so we can end strong. <laughs> my dog. Yep. That's the famous one right there. I had to get a screenshot. So <laughs> like we're, having, we're having fun relating to each other and cracking jokes. So instead of me talking about you all and introducing you, um, let can you all just introduce yourselves very quickly for those who are watching and we'll jump into the content. And we can start with you, DeVille. Oh, uh, DeVille. Um... My name is Devell Love. I'm a Cowboys uh, manager. I'm his older brother, co-founder of 147 Wild Boys. Um, I got a nonprofit I'm coming out with, Universal Love Foundation. And I got many more. So that's all I can say right now. But, you know. My brother. What? Nathus? Uh, yes, DJ Nathus, Power 92, 3 to 7, uh, Afternoon Drive. Also, Nathus at 9, Mixes. Also, you know, you can you hear me? Am I good? Okay, okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> I don't know why to get fit me. Um, Nathan's and Nine makes it 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 at night. Uh, and then on with Ferris at midnight. Call a Midnight Mafia mix playing all the new music and breaking a lot of music at night. So that's what I do. Mixes are good too, y'all. Thank you. Right. Hurricane, would you like to introduce yourself? No, we got to go with Maya. Where may I go? Damn, I she she go. had to jump out for a second, but there she goes. She's back. 
Mayha, can you hear us? <sighs> Y'all killing me. Mayha. Oh, no, I can't hear you guys. Is somebody else mind speaking to see if she can hear you? Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me, Mayha? Okay, I can hear everybody but Cindy. Okay. She did this to me earlier. I think you know, Mayha's so, trying to I was to watching this me. whole thing with no problems. Right. Man, that's from, that's from iPhones, man. All right, well, somebody uh, can let Mayha know. So, Mayha, we need you to introduce yourself. Okay, cool. So, my name is Mayha. I'm Power 92's midday host. So, after our morning show, uh, you guys hear me. So, I'm on from 10 to 3 p.m. every single day. And, yeah, I'm in the media life. Gotcha. A hurricane. I'm hurt. Hurt. Chicago, Chicago Hurricane, Born Legend Management. Uh, some of my clients are Michael Blackstone, uh, Ray Sherman, Wale, Corey Hardrick, just to name a few. Just to name a few. Resume yeah. looking like, damn, just to just, name a few. Just, so just, just a little bit. Oh, my God. Yeah, I can't hear Cindy either. Oh, my goodness. And I'm asking all the questions. You have to be able to hear me. I can hear you. Okay. I told well, them it's the iPhones. That's all it is. I, gar I guarantee they all got iPhones. I mean, I'm on an iPhone. Exactly. Okay, it should be we'll, on the Samsung. We'll start with Hurricane then, and, and, and hopefully Mayha can figure it out or someone will have to relate to her. Um, but it Morse like, code, sign language. Something. Hold up a sign. I, that's what I need. I need to go get a, a pen and paper and just write it down. But Hurricane, um, seriously, jumping into it, how... So you have a lot of clients in entertainment, but a lot of things... Uh -huh. Payment are canceled, done, over with, you know, for now at least because of the pandemic. How sure. have you shifted your clients' priorities and where their attention goes as far as how they're getting their money right now when they can't have concerts or they can't have meet and greets um, and just how they're staying relevant? Well, I was already in the process of doing that uh, prior to this pandemic anyway. Like, I'm always kind of like, um, because I'm self employed. I've always been that one to kind of like make sure that we straight with like seven, you know, eight different streams of revenue aside from just the entertainment business. So that was some of the things that we was uh, already like signing contracts and, and divulging in. And one of the, like the main, the main thing is like the social media internet. That's, that's been a big help for us. And even with like the, um, like we just signed a major deal with Twitch for two of our clients because they're gamers. So um, that that was a major, you know, plus for us. And, you know, so now that everybody's sitting at home, it's just, you know, more revenue stream coming in from just that alone. Gotcha. Um, before I go deeper in that, DeVille, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you. Perfect. So I, I kind of want to address the same question to you, um, which is how have you shifted your clients or even if you want to speak specifically to Cowboy, how have you shifted his priorities and um, just ha what he's doing right now to make money and stay relevant, being that he can't have shows, you know, at first studio time was limited or just not a thing. What are, what are some of the things you all are doing? Oh, exactly. Okay. Um, for, well, for like one for the studio, we got a stu we got two studios in the house. So oh. they constantly so work and doing everything. So even in that, you know, we can get paid from labor studio time at the house. So that's one, one thing right there. And I would say, um, making sure just the business is set up, like just getting like, cause you can get paid quarterly, you know what I'm saying? Doing that, you know, make sure all your business set up right. So you're getting paid like that. So just making sure you save your money and put it to the side or, you know what I'm saying? Every time you had a show doing when it was letting the outside open, save some of the money. Also, mm -hmm. um, other things he was doing is like, uh, he was selling his paintings and uh, all types of open up new hustles and just working 24 seven. Like we just, you know, we gonna keep getting it, but for like for example, uh doing a drive in concert, like that's coming. We might come be coming to Chicago with that. So I can't give you the date, but we do we you know, doing more stuff in Chicago. Even though they're not gonna let outside open, y'all can pull up with y'all cars and, you know, see a performance, you know. That's right that's there. Dope. So that's right. That is we, dope. So basically for for upcoming artists, you both will recommend multiple streams of income, something other than your main talent to get you not only just through times like this, but in general, even if outside was open, like things happen every day, venues shut down, 
promoters, you know, flake on you. Like you have to to keep your business up and going and, and keep that money strong. Correct. Correct. How do you suggest artists keep themselves polished enough to get things like endorsements? Hurricane, I know you mentioned the gaming deal that some of your clients just signed on for. Like what? Aside from maybe playing video on Instagrams, what were they doing to make themselves ideal candidates for such an opportunity? Uh, one, staying out of jail. That's that's the number one thing. <laughs> stay stay out of trouble. Can't hear. Uh, you say you can't hear me. You can't hear Hurricane. No, or Nathan's. One second. Okay, I, I got mine on mute. That's, that's why I you can't talk to me. I'm not saying anything. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can Can Cindy hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Cody, that's can you hear me? I can hear you. Hurricane, can you hear me? Definitely <laughs> can hear you. Mayha, can you hear me? I can hear Hurricane. Okay. Mayha, wow. can Mayha, can't Mayha can't hear me. Girl, can you hear me? No, he can't I, I hear can. you. Oh, he can't? Okay. So, okay. Mayha, I don't think you can hear me right hurricane. now. What yeah. will do? You can't hear me, bro? He can't hear you. So what we'll do is we'll let you finish and, and I'll summarize the answer for him. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go work on that uh, sales slug deal for you. We'll get y'all some sales slugs over there. <laughs> man, that's the wave, man. Just just just, just FYI, um Samsung is iPhone's biggest supplier. Just 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 had to throw that out there. So the Samsung make yeah, Samsung makes two hundred dollars off of every Apple phone that's sold. Every one of them. So that that's a fact. You can Google that. Did it's you in know? Forbes. All so. right. Um, so DeVille, basically I was asking what well, I'm not sure if you heard the question or you have some technical difficulties, but just how do you keep your clients polished up to get certain endorsements and other streams of income? Um, and one of the main things Hurricane Hurricane shared with us, excuse me, was stay out of jail, stay out of trouble, you know, stay the ideal candidate. So do you have anything to add or challenge that? Uh, I, I agree with that because some artists, they get they get in so much trouble, they won't be able to do a concert in certain cities or even come back to their hometown. So to stay in a clean line, like, like don't even, uh, like tomorrow we finna, uh, we, we in Atlanta right now, we finna go feed the homeless. We got pans of chickens and everything. Like, you know, we working on the little documentary thing. So it's just that, like, just, just, you know, just don't get into the extraness, you know, with everything, you know, keep your, you gotta keep your record clean. Cause you know, the shows, you know, even though they got the shows closed right now, you can't they can go, them back go up. Over to, uh, you know, go into certain cities because you got a background or go to UK, you know what I'm saying? Get your passport or something like stuff like that. Like you just gotta, you know, think smarter, think ahead and just think ahead. Be, uh awareness, have awareness of everything. Like you just when you wanna be an artist, you're just not a rapper, you just you just everything, you know. So Yeah. So innovation is a theme I'm taking away. Um, you know, be it uh, intentionally where you all are coming up with new ideas like drive-in concerts or just on the spot and you're you're handling business the best way you can with everything shut down. So switching over a little bit to Mayha and DJ Nafis. Um, Mayha, starting with you, I know that throughout this quarantine, you started the Lit and Live series on yes. Instagram. So is that, was that all your idea was that something you did specifically because of the pandemic like was it a pivot you made you or, know like you know talk to us about that i think quarantine has been great because it's given us creatives a chance to like really see what other things that we could tap into so lit in live series came from me simply knowing that one of my strongest traits is interviewing and it also came from the fact that I was just sick and tired of interviewing the same kind of people. You know, I'm asking the same kind of questions. You know, um, you know, we get these artists and it's always the same thing. You're dropping music. You're going to have a tour. <laughs> and that's it. You know, and like, I love... I mean, you can ask about, like, I, even when I did have Cowboy, like, I dig a lot deeper. Like, I, I'm so curious. And, you know, I just like to pick people's brains. So with Lit and Live series, I was like, you know what? 
I don't get to interview whoever I want to interview at Power 92. So Lit and Live Series, I was like, you know, I have the connections. I got the plugs. I know the people. I just didn't have the platform. So I was like, Instagram Live is right in front of me. I can't believe I never utilized it before like that. I was just utilizing it for like, you know, little topics that I would do on the radio. So that's where Lit and Live came from. I just wanted to talk to other people and highlight other dope people and not just in the city. I'm talking nationwide. And it's just been really fun. Um, my queen key one really took off. I'm and um, <laughs> I love situations like that because, you know, a lot of these people are my friends and they open up more. Um, I was telling, who did I have the other day where I was just like, Ebenezer, I was like, are you by yourself? And he was like, yeah, I am. And I was like, you know, I love IG live interviews because, you know, um, in the studio, an artist will bring their whole entire crew. Okay. And sometimes you ask a question and they're like, oh, I don't want to answer this in front of my gang, you know, and then it makes the interview just I don't know, a little less boring, a little less personal, a little less just everything. So Lit and Live series, IG interviews, like I just love it. And it's conversational. It's fun. It's it's just been a really good time. And it's, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people do it, too. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think it's dope that you thought to utilize that resource right in front of you. And that's yeah. the point that I want to drive home. Um, because again, with things opening, it doesn't mean that the pandemic is over. So people still need to be able to innovate, to, p to pivot quickly. Um, DJ Nafis, I know that you, you've been a part of the radio mix parties at the station um, and you all had a whole mm -hmm. series going for Memorial Day weekend. First, should we anticipate one of those for 4th of July weekend too? Naturally, yes. You know, 4th of July is going to be crazy like that. Uh, we're going to go in even harder and we're going to invite, you know, we got new DJs, we got Word of Thrill, of course, we got a Mars, we got a bunch of DJs that come apart of this, and then new DJs that, you know, Bam or Jay try to add to the team, it's all good, you know, we just try to try to, you know, give some exposure to some of the uh, DJs who are in the city doing what they're supposed to do. Shout out to Commando, he's new, fresh on the team too, yes. so he's doing his thing. Yeah, 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 DJ. <laughs> So yeah, Fourth of July, you know these uh, pandemic parties at home parties. We, we kind of been doing them for a long time anyway. Anytime there's a holiday, uh, we've always did mixes and try to promote new music and try to promote the DJs at the same time. So you can definitely expect that. Gotcha. How have you felt about having to have more of a virtual presence and to do lives and do mixes that way? Um, and how do you think? that that feeling has shaped some of the business choices you may make moving forward out of this pandemic? Well, uh, doing virtual allows you to be able to personally connect to your audience now. Now, it's almost like you really got to have your presentation on point. So that means visually, uh, auditory, you got to have all of those things in place so a person can really like get into who you are as a DJ. Sometimes, you know, with the club, you could really get away with a lot of different things. So if you're coming in at two o'clock, the whole crowd is drunk. So they don't really care how you sound as long as you play for me, though. <laughs> you know, you you live. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you say if you trendy you know, or shout out to Shorty over there, her birthday or whatever, you lit. You know, you, you consider the king of the world. But now it puts DJs in a position where they really have to be creative about how they present their music, what kind of music they're presenting, and the messages that they're trying to send as well, you know? So, you know, I see a lot of DJs using it as a way to be able to get uh, people to donate to them on Cash App, mm -hmm. which is cool, you know? Uh, shout out to DJ D Nice, who took this whole virtual quarantine DJ thing to a whole new level, where he is getting sponsorships through Pepsi, working with Michelle Obama now, these virtual DJ gigs right now are, are awesome for a lot of different DJs for a lot of reasons. It's that connection to you as that person who's looking at us right now, watching us talk about these things. So, you know, it's definitely there. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. So both of you, Mayha and Nafis, before I kind of shift the conversation back the other way, um, are in radio. 
And mm -hmm. I remember not long ago, a report coming out saying like that surprisingly radio numbers were, were doing extremely well, which for a lot of people, they thought it was interesting because typically people listen to the radio in their car. But we're aware that there's apps you can listen to stations on and things like that. But do you all see that trend of radio numbers being high, kind of sticking around, even with some of the restrictions lifting with the stay at home orders? I do. Um, I, I don't know where it came from. Even back when I was in college years ago, um, <laughs> they were saying radio is a dying industry and like it's never been that case. And, you know, that article didn't surprise me when my boss sent it to us in a group chat. I was just like, of course, like, why wouldn't it? You know, and then also people do definitely love the fact that, you know, we're personable and they tune in for that as well. You know what I mean? They tune in for so many different reasons, but yeah, like, um, I don't think it's just in your car. And I really do think that it's going to stick around even before the pandemic happened. Um, my boss sent me an article saying that people were tuning in more to radio even before the, the stay at home order happened. So I hope it, it, it stays that way. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. You know, I hope it does stay at a nice level, even after the pandemic is over, because again, it, radio is for information as well. So yeah. you may not get information off of the gram or on the internet because you're driving, or it's just that sometimes, you know, information just comes in different ways. So radio is definitely a place for people to come get information, find out exactly what's going on locally. And, uh, and also again, with music, sometimes people get tired of like trying to put their own playlist together in the car, you know, musically, we are the curators, try to figure it out. We're the ones who are curating the music for the people in the car now and trying to put together uh, an experience for the listener that's driving or even at home listening to us on the app. Gotcha. Thank you all for sharing that. And um, I think may have something you said and that both of you actually information from NAFIS and, and, the part about being personal for me, if anything, I think that's why a lot of people do listen to the radio, just hear the radio personalities because the, the song mm -hmm. kind of rotate unless it is a custom mix or, you know, something like that. So that's important. I think that speaks to branding and that speaks to having relationships with your fans so that even in a pandemic, people are still, you know, going to tune into the radio from their phones because they're not in the cars or jumping back to, you know, actual artists, DeVille and Hurricane. How do you all plan to kind of keep your artists close to their fan base, literally, um, when things like, so say outside is opening back up and maybe some sort of meet and greet is approved, you know, but now we have masks or we have barriers where they have to stand six feet apart. Do you all foresee um, any way to still make that fan feel like, they're, feel like they're right up on Cowboy or feel like they're right up, you know, right up on Wale and... Anything like that? And we can start with DeVille. Um, basically, I don't know how would I attack, how to attack this question. Um, more like, I don't want to say uh, back to like Cal, more major fan base. I will say it would be Chicago. Like, you know, his uh, core fan base would be just Chicago, how he kind of like, a, you know, sh shot it out the blue. Uh, mm -hmm. It would just be doing, like I said, just more things in Chicago, like just, uh, we we are forming an AAU team, the Wild Boy team, you know. So it would be a like you know nice Wild Boy AAU team. We, we getting together in Chicago and just getting real heavy with the youth in Chicago because the youth makes the music. You know what I'm saying? Like the youth is like everything. So uh, I would say that would be getting you know Cal stronger with his core fan base and like his day ones and keeping that solid. So. It's it's just gonna be a lot of stuff coming out in the next couple of weeks, like with Long Live the Kings Deluxe, the album and everything. So I'm excited for everything. So it's gonna be a lot of Chicago based, just if you know pop up. So, just but more be, uh, in tune with um like appealing to the emotions and working with the youth. Like you're not gonna let the physical distance that may be in place at those events stop you all from making the impact. Is what you're saying? No. Gotcha. Hurricane, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I've been sticking, um, I mean, closer to, like, the brand. 
um, because they essentially spend the same money as, as as far as show money goes, and it's a smaller, uh, more intimate fan base, and it's a smaller, intimate crowd. So just trying to protect those relationships and, you know, still give people the same uh, outcome from it. Like we had just right right before the pandemic happened, like we had just did a big concert at the, uh, at the AT&T store downtown. And, you know, it was roughly about, what, 200 people in the store? So I think things like that will pick up more because these brands have been reaching out like more and more to get artists to do things to promote their brands as well. So I think that'll be the start to um, us, you know, getting our artists back in the, um, in the rotation and keeping the budgets up. Okay. Nice. So, yeah, question. I was actually going to ask you a question, Cody, but if you have a question, go ahead. Um, I was going to come in more on on what they send with their artists. Uh, so do y'all artists have any type of uh, um, how how would like, how are you preparing them mentally and, and you probably to go back on to being, like, being around people? Like, how are you preparing them mentally for that? Like, do they have... Uh, well, I, I can speak for my artists. Really, I mean, I mean, bro, if you watch any one of them on Instagram, like, they really haven't been social distancing because, like, it, it really hasn't impacted any of our lives from that perspective because... We still in the studio. Like Mike is still doing video shoots. He's still doing, you know, parties. It just it's just more of a close knit thing than than doing it with a bunch of strangers. I, I, I can't even say that because we still meeting different people in the studio. So I mean, it hasn't really impacted their lives yet as far as the Corona thing. So I mean, either they're in L.A. or Atlanta, and we know. Atlanta been open for almost a month now, so you know. And then LA, everybody's pretty much doing whatever they want to do. Big mansion party, so it hasn't really affected um, my artists per se. So I don't think they're gonna have a hard time adjusting, getting back with people. As, as the as the as as the manager, do you? Because <laughs> uh, I, I always say, as the manager, do you really did you do you go along with like how you just say with the status quo, like everything is just open, we just gonna do whatever, or is it? Are you advising them, or would you? Are you advising them to not to to practice social distance? Like this ain't smart. We y'all need to move this way. Uh, it's it's a twofold to that. I mean, we do have extensive conversations and I am educating them on different aspects of like, you know, this whole system and what's going on. But like, you got to think about it from my perspective, like me personally with one artist, I took 200 flights last year. You know, I stayed in 250 different hotels and, you know, different places. So as far as like, we was living this life prior to this pandemic. Like there are diseases prior to this. There's, you know, viruses prior to this. So we've been, you know, immersed in this for like, you know, our career. So it, it's not like a big shell shock, like one specific thing that's like, oh man, we, we you know, kind of like shutting down because th this is our life. We're around, you know, hundreds of thousands of people every single week. So I don't think, from that perspective, it's, it's been like, okay, everybody's sitting in the house because we all feel like we're pretty much immune to the shit anyway. Hmm. Transparency. I appreciate it. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's really, it's, it's just facts. It's, if you listen to like what the scientists are saying and what the doctors are saying, it just, like they're telling you, bro, they just, they just add a thousand people to Illinois that committed suicide as COVID deaths. They already told, they did the same thing in New York. They just added 4,000 extra deaths. And, you know, we, we are all intelligent individuals. And they tell you, they say, look, these aren't like conspiracy theorists. These are the directors of our health community telling us, like, look, if you had cancer and we put you in hospice and you died, we're marking that as a COVID-related death. I mean, how, how do you like, and this is not something that like, again, that a conspiracy theorist is saying like, this is what your governor said. This is what the director of the health department said. So, I mean, how do you, 
say, hey, you know, and then you got to think about like all the, like I go to I, like Whole Foods right across the street, the same girl's been working there, the same 18 year old, 16 year old girl's been working there throughout this whole pandemic, bro. And they fine. So we just had a big ass party on the west side where, you know, you know, it made TMZ. What happened to all them people? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, you know, you got to call a spade a spade, man, when you see it. But, you know, as far as like when it first started happening, yeah, I was like, bro, don't go outside. Put your mask on. Put, But then when you start looking at the science behind it, I'm not just speaking like, you know, from my personal aspect. I'm saying like, look, uh, if you don't have an N95, that bullshit ass Gucci mask that you got on, that like 99% of the masks that niggas are wearing around this motherfucker, those cloth masks, those don't do shit, my nigga, They're for viruses that. or bacteria. So it's like now it's, a, it's more of a psychological thing than a health thing. Because in the beginning, they was like, nah, you don't need to wear a mask because theoretically speaking, you don't need to wear them if you're not wearing the right ones. And now everybody just, you know, so comfortable with putting on these dumb ass masks. It's just like, it just, it just makes you say, mm. and, and from, think, from a real perspective. Go ahead. What you, I, 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 what you're saying, I think that most people that's listening to this right now trying to figure out how they could, you know, deal with being in the public days. And I think that because of the, the shift in what laws happen, you know, as far as like now at certain places, they have it on the wall. Do not come in if you don't have a mask on. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is it's shifting how we operate as people mm -hmm. in this particular time right now. And I think for some people, you know, you got to respect their fear. Okay. You got to respect. And I do that. We do that. We do that. Yeah. You got to respect their fear. You know, I, I'm often, I'm the one always saying, I don't need a mask on. I'm finna just go to the store. But my wife, she is very protective. When I get back in the car, she's sanding me down, hand sanitizer. <laughs> hand. Hey, just take your mask, honey. You didn't take your mask with you. Go on over here. You know, she's always on me, but I can't go back with her and go like, yo, I, I hate this. No, I need to comply as well because you got to respect the fear of everybody else because for real, sometimes people could make a disease come into themselves based off their thoughts. People don't really understand that your consciousness is very powerful to your body and your brain. All right, so you could you could make yourself have a disease just based off thinking about it. So I don't I don't feel monger anybody. I just stand myself down, put the mask on, and do what we have to do. And I think that when the, the economy does open up and we do get a chance to be as DJs out in the field or as radio personalities doing van hits or live remotes. And then we have to deal with, uh, you know, being around other people. We just have to respect each other because the person who might want to meet me might still be on social distance mode. Back up over there. I love you, but man, over there, my brother, you understand what I'm saying? So you, we just have to have to respect that part. That's all. And, and, and I want to, I want to touch on what you just said, Nathan. Like, I don't want this to come off as condescending or i don't want this and not from your position but from my position when i said in the beginning i don't want you to take my information that i was putting out there, and, and this goes for everybody what i was saying that viruses don't exist what i'm saying is the same thing that you were doing prior to this epidemic or the same thing i was doing and my people were doing prior to the epidemic we still have been doing that so i'm gonna give you an example right like how now everybody want to wash their hands and everybody want to keep their shit clean. Like I was already having these right here. Motherfuckers ain't seen these in months. The Lysol shits, the portable Lysol shits. When I was getting on airplanes prior to the pandemic, I had hell out Lysol that I was using to wipe down the seats and the same thing when they go to the hotel room. They flipping them rooms so quick. There's not a chance in hell that I would just jump out my ass on a bed in a hotel room without life stalling it down. So what I'm saying is it's bigger than coronavirus. Like if you don't understand how these diseases work, 
The reason why I wasn't getting sick before was because now I wasn't shaking too many niggas' hands. If I did shake it, then I would wash my hands before I put in my face. You know what I'm saying? So it's just different, you know, things that we did. And I educated my artists on prior to this. And we got text messages, man, bro. We got to do this. We got to sanitize the room before you, you finish the room. This was a year ago prior to this. So I'm not saying like, you know, don't feel like you can't, you know, protect yourself from, you know, but it, 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 it gets to a point where it just becomes overkill now. And just like you were saying about the mask, you know, all you got to do is say, you know, when you go into certain places, man, I don't wear no mask for health reasons. And they cannot, absolutely not stop you from coming in the business. Well, but, I want yeah, still- to jump in here if I can, Hurricane. Um, one, because we got to start coming home. But to that point, that, that's been a big thing, though. And I think that's important for us to address moving forward in the pandemic. You're saying they can't stop you if you say that, but they have stopped consumers. They are stopping That's illegal. And, and they're standing strong on the governor's mandate about it. Um, no, no, but so- no. The, the governor just made a statement of the day said that that's illegal. So, you know, they no one can stop you from going into a, a public business, you know, and they can't ask you due to the HIPAA law about your, your medical condition why you don't have to wear a mask. Yeah. So if you just state that for medical reasons, and that's just about knowing your, your, your rights and your laws when it comes to certain things. If you say, hey, unfortunately, due to medical reasons, I'm not required to wear a mask, then they have to continue service on you. And it's been like a couple times in Chicago, I've done that from just from, you know, just I didn't have a mask. And, yo, you know, I need to get this real quick. I'm not going to not go in this store, this restaurant and, and, and deal with that. And it was OK. I think it all comes down to protecting yourself. Like, F what everybody else is doing. If you don't want to wear a mask to the store, that's cool. But. To me, it's like, if you're paranoid about the coronavirus, wear a mask, protect yourself, wash your hands, do what you got to do for you. And that's kind of what I learned at the end of all of this is, you know, you really do get to see how people were living because I am with Hurricane on this. I was doing a lot of this shit way before, excuse me, way before um, the the pandemic happened. I was wiping down the studio all the time. Um, Just those things were things like I always did, but never really thought that it was such a big deal until you started realizing that, no, people are dirty out here. Yeah. And so I'm at a point where, like, it's kind of like when you go driving. Like, I'm scared because sometimes other people don't know how to drive. So I'm going to drive. So I'm just going to wear a mask. Because I don't know if you guys are dirty or not. And that's just, just protect yourself. That's just how I feel about it. Control what you can control yeah. and, and let the rest go. We can't control yeah. what others do, but you can't but control, I can control what I do. Exactly. Your, your hygiene habits, your practices when you're in public. Yeah. And it, it starts from within. Um, I want, I'm, I think we are in true creative fashion. We start in one facet and end up in a, in a totally different one. Um, And I love that. I don't think that's bad at all. But I do want to wheel it back in just a bit and get us out of here. We've been at this for a while and it's been been dope. Thank you all. Thank everybody that was a part of it before we got to this segment. Um, And Cody, kind of kind of bring it home with you. Unfortunately, I didn't get to, to everything that I planned. But for you specifically, I know as the head of a of a media outlet, of an entertainment company, it actually probably works in our favor that everybody's been stuck at home. So how do you see things kind of shifting as these restrictions are more relaxed and people are going back outside? And what are some plans that maybe people in a similar position to you, they have a a virtually based business. How can they keep their numbers up moving forward? How can they keep their numbers up moving forward? I would say what it based on the content you create. You know, uh, if you study this game and you study anything, you just gotta study consumer behavior, and you gotta understand why the consumer is behaving that way. Um, and if they're if uh, if they're if they're if you if you create a content where only they can listen, they only only reason why they're paying attention to it because they're at home or on Instagram Live. Once things open back up, and if, let's say if it opens back up regularly, those people are not going to be at home watching Instagram Live. So if you built your whole brand around that, 
you know, that's not going to be, that's not sufficient, you know what I'm saying, efficient. So personally, me, uh, and what us, because we both work for the same media company, um, we try to make sure we build our content that they can last, that people are going to watch, that's going to people going to watch, even they at home, they're not at home, you know what I'm saying, uh, things like podcasts and interviews that the regular person will watch when they at work. And they it use it as background music. Um, so you just got to be really mindful of the content you create. And that's crazy. We you just asked me that question about content because um, I was going to uh, address this situation, uh, even though things is opening up back slowly. We got entertainment managers on here that deal with artists, and we got people like myself and one with DJ Nathan and Mayha that deal with artists as well, like interviews. Like we've been doing a lot of virtual interviews. Like when is it gonna be safe to get back to doing these interviews in person? Because we know the virtual thing is cool, but there's nothing like that in the room, that bonding, exchanging phone numbers, jokes, that behind the scenes stuff. So it's like, what's the headspace like? Like of getting back into doing those. Like I would want to know, Hurricane, because you just gave me an interesting um perspective. Like when would you tell your if it's so if it's cool for your artists to do interviews right now? D Love, are you holding Cowboy back from doing interviews? You know what I'm saying? Nafis, Mayha, uh, we all work in the same industry. Are you cool with people coming to the station doing an interview, or you still just want to be like, yo, no, I still need some time. So that's something in this industry, like interviews is like real big. So I really wanted to get feedback on that. Well, I'm a- you know. One thing I know that's for sure is that I don't know. (laughs) And that's the crazy part about this all is there are so many unanswered things. I don't know, Cody. Like, that is such a real thing. I don't know when. Because it's not really up to me. It's not really up to Hurricane. It's not really up to Nafis. It's up to, like, what the CDC air quotes, I'm going to do that, says, like, it's what the government says, what the state says, like, you know, you see the emails that we get at work, we can't even be in the same studio as our producers, like, so, I don't know why I'm going to see any of (laughs) y'all, like, but but can I, can I, can I, can I, Cody is, I don't know, I mean, but, I mean, like, I'm going I'm to use the mayor, for example, right? Like, you've been watching these press conferences, right? Mm-hmm. We all been watching these press conferences, right? They've been doing hella interviews with hella people doing all the press conferences. Mm-hmm. And these people don't live together. So what makes it different from the interviews that they're doing from the interviews that we do? And I think to that, um, may I like to kind of tie in what Hurricane is saying as well. Honestly, a lot of the guidelines are stating that, you know, it's not so much about quarantining and only being around your your own members of your own household anymore. Um, it's just about the practice that you do take when you're in person with a, with another person. So maybe some of the, the rooms at the studio, you know, got to increase in size or whatever it may be, because you're going to have to be on one side of the room and whoever you're interviewing is just going to have to be on the other. Like, we're just going to have to move some mics around or something like it's not so much impossible or whatever. They're, they're putting the restrictions. I mean, they're putting the guidelines rather, excuse me, in place. Just, you know, how how closely to the T will they be followed, I think, is the key. Um so interviews, right. Cody, they gonna happen. They they gonna happen. People ain't gonna stop making no money. You know, let's and I, I I say it in that tone of voice purposely. Like you just gotta be transparent with it. It's it's nothing to to try to sit here and be politically correct about. Like nobody's gonna stop their bag. They're gonna find a way. Like we haven't stopped our bags in this quarantine. Like people are going virtual, people are doing all these things. So if anything, although it will be different outside opening back up, it, it makes it a little bit easier for these in-person interviews to happen because now you just got to do it with your mask on six to eight feet apart. Okay. Um, I I think this is a, personally, I think that's just a whole psychological thing that is like, um, for, and I, I'm speaking for the, the up and coming curators because 
a lot of times of them getting their shot is when artists or movie stars are doing press runs and they're physically there and they know the PR person is there. Now you're dealing with the video call and I haven't had the, the problem with this. I've turned a lot of major artists down over this quarantine because that's just one of my focus. Um, but I know a lot of up and coming creators. It's like, yo, man, like, how can I get Cowboy? Or, damn, I just saw what you calling him do Wiz, and everybody doing Wiz, everybody doing him. Like, how can I get them? If if they was in Chicago doing the press run, it wouldn't be nothing for me to just be there, and I could probably get a few words, get a few pictures. It's like, but now it's like, damn, do I really want to go over there and get a few pictures in? Like, it's like, like, what's the or is like you guys manage artists? Are you? Uh, do you artists really want to? Do y'all want y'all artists just to be around all these people? So that's just what my head is with that. Like, uh, I wait. I already told you. I I mean, I want to hear cowboy shit. I want to. Devell, can you touch on that for us, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, like for the artists being around people. Yeah. Do you have any concern <laughs> about it? Uh, you feel that the cowboy specifically is in a mindset where you gotta get them out of it. Hurricane's not worried about that with his clients. What about you? Do you have to yeah, acclimate well, him back to society, uh, basically? Yeah, Cal, he's he's younger, and um, I, I constantly uh, drill Cal with like positive, like positivity, like uh, he's been doing after the uh, this pandemic. You're gonna see Cal a little bit cut. He's been doing like <laughs> workouts and stuff to get him like mentally strong and just like okay. just keeping his mind from not drifting you know what i'm saying just keeping it solid so uh i say wear a mask like i said we don't know like i don't want him around mugs like we <laughs> stay back you know what i'm saying nah but, nigga, uh, she, no. he can take pictures she, of some fans and stuff it's just i i don't know i want him to stay healthy no so, we we, we talking about right now physically so i just want him to stay healthy and we can't, 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 can't keep this keep it keep it going so Atlanta is Honestly, open to like, Bill and Cowboy do interviews. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Atlanta is open, but uh, we did a video shoot out here, but it was different. It was it wasn't that it wasn't as many people. You know what I'm saying? It was, you know, like all right, this who this who here. You now I'm saying they got their mask on, and we ain't finna <laughs> keep it. You know, y'all stay over there with that and let them get that. You know, it's just minimize, just keeping that thing okay because we don't know what's going on, what they putting out here. To be honest, you know what I'm saying? So it's just staying safe and just moving smart and awareness. So better safe than sorry, right? Man. Exactly. Well, with that, um, if there are no dying, urging words for us creatives to get out and get out of chest, I would like to just the, the same way I have with every other group, sincerely thank you all for your time this evening. Um, your patience, your insight is, is, is so appreciated. Um, I hope to do this again one day. Uh, hopefully not about the same topic. Hopefully the pandemic don't go on forever and ever. Um, but you all are so well versed in so many different things. I hope that we can give the community this type of, of insight and, and this type of conversation and, and the raw dynamics, the transparency is gonna match. So I appreciate that. Like Hurricane, I know you probably still got some people in the comments like, what is dude talking about? But you ain't shut down and I, I appreciate that. Um so thank you all for your time this evening. Well just, for I just, I just, I just yeah I was I was gonna say this before we leave. Um I appreciate all of the panelists, I appreciate all of y'all because I have something? personal relationship. <laughs> this is the <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, well, he can't hear you, but we can hear you. He appreciates you, Devell. He appreciates all the panelists. He got personal relationships, and we don't let him finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I appreciate everything that everybody's doing in their own perspective lane, man. And just want to give big ups to everybody on this panel. Appreciate um, it. Yeah. To, to all everybody, everybody. Appreciate you, bro. Cody, do you have final words or a question? You got final words. Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna Before let we... I'm gonna let Mayha and do, is it to them? Can I let them go and? Oh, you can let them go. Okay, okay. thank you all so much again. No, 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 no. All these are about let them speak. 
Okay. No, like let them leave so that you right. can say your parting words and we can end this. I know people at home are supporting us strong, but we gotta wrap up. But this, this is this. I think this is a very key point. So first of all, um, I want to say everybody that's home that's still standing strong and for the remaining panelists and the panelists of the board that was watching, I want you guys to give Cindy right here a round of applause for moderating this oh. amazing panel tonight. Uh, she put a lot of work of making sure we this thing ran smoothly. Um, I know y'all seen the emails and see how everything was structured. Like I want like Cindy to put a lot into this. Uh, so I want everybody in the comments, you know, what I'm saying shout out Cindy, you know, and get her some, you know, yes, some emojis. Follow me. You know, can. <laughs> Follow her. Like she's real dope. If anybody looking for brand management and just somebody to get you on point, hire her. Um uh, and then also, I want to say I want to everybody else that came in and shot, that came through. Um, all the panelists on here, a majority of them I got personal relationships with. Um, and I think that everybody learned something. I learned a lot from each one of y'all. And we got to keep these community discussions like the phone suit. We got to share this information. Like y'all all have information we got to continue to share. So let's keep this going. Man. I appreciate that. Thank yes. you for that. Absolutely. Thank you all. So. I'll release you all from the stream. We'll get out of here. And Cody, thank you for your efforts as well, for the concept, for allowing me to be a part of bringing it to life to all of you watching. Thank you. You are just as important as the panelists. Like without an audience, we have no purpose here. Um, so Cody, you have an awesome night. I'll release you from the stream as well, my friend. And to everyone watching here again, I am Cindy. I was your moderator this evening. I am the supervisor. Oh, Lord, I was getting my title messed up. It's long. Um, but just supervising editor and director of content development at What's the Word, as well as CEO of Morally Sinful Productions. And I'm also the EP and creative director over at Sincerely Richard, which is a minority fashion based platform that you all should check out if you have any interest in fashion want to shop black, like we're, we're in a pandemic. So support small businesses, black businesses. And if you're looking for that specifically in fashion, follow Sincerely Richard. So I love you all. Thank you for watching. I hope that you got the fruitful information that we intended for you to get and have an awesome night. Please stay safe, you all. And even when the outside opens back up, do whatever you got to do to stay healthy. Good night.